Modern Russian Poetry, an Anthology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kevin Davidson. Modern Russian Poetry, an Anthology, selected and translated by Babette Deutsch and Avram Yarmolinsky. Introduction. Modern Russian literature took its rise in the early nineteenth century. This was more or less the Russian counterpart of the Elizabethan age. Energizing liberal influences were in the air, men's pulses were stirred by the Napoleonic drama, a national self-consciousness came into being, the winds of a new world were blowing from widened horizons and there was the same coincidence of favorable environment with the accident of genius. Yet if the English Renaissance found its expression in drama, it is notable that nascent Russian literature blossomed in lyricism. England had her Shakespeare, and Russia had her Pushkin, with a difference. He is placed in the company of Dante, Shakespeare, and Goethe by his compatriots, yet even they admit that he lacks the universal significance of his elder peers he remains however the national poet acknowledged as the first and perhaps the greatest literary artist of his country a figure upon whom more admiration and scholarship have been lavished than upon any one else had he been accessible to the outside world its current conceptions of the mood and manner of russian literature would be different the Byronism with which he began early gave place to a reconciliation with reality and to a classic sobriety, which made Merimea declare him an Athenian captive among the Scythians. The intensity of his passionate nature was governed by a sense of measure and harmony. His poetry has that quality of normalcy and health which render it educative and to the foreigner uninteresting. The latter may agree with Flaubert that the Russian master is flat, and to suspect that his is the unexciting art whose motto is propria communia dicere. Pushkin was surrounded by a pleiad of lyricists, whose work was of a minor order, but yet was distinguished by a measure of originality. Of these, the somber Baratinsky is now perhaps best remembered. In a sense, Tutyev too belonged to this group. A contemporary of Pushkin, he was under his influence. Yet he survived the master by many years, and the more significant part of his unique contribution to Russian poetry was written much later. Of all the classicists, Tutyev is most likely to find a way to the understanding and sympathy of the outside world. His is a deep and authentic voice. Through his poetry blows the wind of his thought, as a breeze bellies a sail to a certain shape. It is a pantheistic philosophy, instinct with the profound cosmic sympathies of a Chinese sage on his lonely mountain. His universe was the battleground of light and darkness. Both were native to him. He did not dismiss the ancient chaos with a facile gesture of tender-minded idealism, but rather saw in it the dark face of God. The mantle of Pushkin fell not upon Tyutyev, who wrote for posterity, but rather upon Lermontov. He was an egocentric creature with a romantic nostalgia for the supersensuous. His lyricism is informed with a graceful demonism and a proud pessimism which naturally endear him to a youthful audience. Yermontov revolted not against the Tsar of all the Russians, but against the God of heaven and earth. Yet the growing civic bias made it possible to put a social interpretation upon the disquietude which pervades his work. Thus the forensic Nekrasov, who in the next generation voiced the civic conscience of an epoch of reform, is considered to have issued from Lermontov. Nekrasov's troubled and uneven verse dwelt with the miseries of the peasant and the proletarian, it celebrated the cause of the masses, 
and made itself the vehicle for the peccavi of the gentry, aware of its outstanding debt to the people. The age was also glad to give laurels to the folk poet, such as Koltsov and Nikitin. The sixties and seventies, the period in which Nekrasov flourished, harnessed the literary Niagara to political action. The age felt that life is real, life is earnest, and that art is not its goal. The permanent abolition of serfdom was coincident with a temporary abolition of aesthetics. The very existence of a socially indifferent poetry was called into question. In this unfriendly atmosphere, a group of poets nevertheless carried on the Pushkin tradition of self-sufficient lyricism, Maikov, Foth, Alexei Tolstoy, and, to a certain extent, Polonsky, all deriving from the idealism of the forties, stand out unrelated to the period in which they wrote. These shared with the French Parnassians an allegiance to the dogma of art for art's sake, and Maikov approached their plasticity and impassivity. Aesthetes are inimical to revolution, not because they love justice less, but because they love beauty more. What defined the isolation of these poets was the fact that they belonged to a conservative camp. Foth developed a great lyrical activity towards the close of his life, in the eighties. Those were years of social stagnation and prolific pale poetry. It was only in the next decade, when the yellow book was blooming on London bookstalls and the sunflowers on London lapels, that the first signs of a literary and primarily lyric revival showed themselves in Russia. It was preceded by proclamations somewhat like a king who is not too sure of his welcome. The vanguard of theorists included Belinsky, Minsky, and Merezhkovsky. Here, reversing the natural order, poetics came before poetry. The champions of modernism revolted against the traditional subservience of literature to social progress. They asserted an autonomy and primacy of art, and offered the milk of mysticism to the soul starved on positivist fare. Above all, they preached an individualism, whose watchword was Fese que tul voldra and which took to its heart Stirner's anarchy and Nietzsche's amoralism. Balmont, Brusov, and Sologup were the leading poets who initiated the practice of what Minsky and Merzhikovsky had been preaching, and who founded a school in the loose sense of the term. This was the symbolist, or as some prefer to call it, neo-romantic school. They were clearly inspired by foreign models, and many declared the whole new poetry a warmed-over French dish. Yet the spontaneous and indigenous character of the movement is now beyond question, its studied eccentricity notwithstanding. It was only for a short time that it showed the earmarks of Western decadence, although its detractors persisted in the term, anti-social prejudice, a toying with Satanism, and concentration on sex were but a temporary phase. The decadent aspect of Russian modernism is best exemplified by Sologup, an exasperated solipsist living in a sick phantasmal world. The heterogeneity and complexity of the movement can hardly be exaggerated. Each writer is a law unto himself, yet all share a fevered intensity and the literary method of symbolism. To the true symbolist, the measure of a verse echoes the song the morning stars sing together. He posits a correspondence between sensuous and mystic realities, using imagery as the sign of a remote and transcendent significance. It remained for the following generation thus to develop the religious implications of the theory. As for Balmont, with his fluent spontaneity, and Brusov in his more slow and solid achievement, they are chiefly concerned with problems of form and with the cult of a beauty founded upon a flight from reality. This holds good for the sinister magic of Sologup in his early work, 
All three, especially Broussoff, are conscious craftsmen with an authentic musical gift. They have greatly enriched the medium which they employ. While the symbolist school united the best talents, there were, of course, poets who remained extra muros. The more important of them is Bunyan, a lyricist of rare economy and sensitiveness to color. He carries on the classic tradition, remote from the violences and vagaries of his fellows. A curious incident in the history of Russian symbolism is the career of Alexander Dobrolubov. One of the earliest disciples of the French decadence, he ended as a sectarian of prophet. He lived in a coffin-shaped room, papered in black, where he sought Baudelaire's Paradis Artificiel by consuming opium and smoking hashish, and once he issued, clad in black even to his eternal gloves, to preach suicide to his fellow students. He became, in the end, a holy vagabond wearing the coarse clothes of the Volga peasant and leading a large mystic sect. Dobrolubov's evolution is, to a certain extent, typical of the development of the symbolist movement, this, beginning with a revolt against the tyranny of utilitarian morality, ended with the reassertion of the ineluctable ethos and a deepened mysticism. Synchronously with the revolution of 1905, a group of younger men within the fold began to transvalue the symbolist transvaluations, aided and abetted by the older symbolists themselves, Chief among the newcomers were Ivanov, Bieli, Bloch, and Voloshin. They were impatient of the cult of beauty and looked askance at the gambols of the free individual. Their poetry is passionate metaphysics, groping toward religious ultimates, spiritually deriving from Solovyov and Dostoevsky. They are engaged with religion and, to a large extent, with the messianic role of the Russian people. In Ivanov and professedly in Chulkov, mysticism is wedded to a curious collectivism. Ivanov declares his verse to be the carven crystal cup for the sacred wine of communal religious consciousness, while in France symbolism contented itself with the part of a literary method, in Russia it tended to become a philosophy and even an ethics. Problems of technique, as such, are no longer in the foreground. Symbolism is now considered the characteristic of all poetry. Substance is what these sophisticated lyricists are seeking, and so we find them turning to the imperishable gods of Hellas, wandering down exotic vistas, exploring with Gorodetsky the native folklore, embracing with Kuzmin the delights of stylization. A doctrinaire fury rides all these poets. They are inveterate preface writers, and, what is worse, do not leave their prefaces entirely out of their art, forgetting that philosophy, in Simon's words, is the dung which lies at the roots of poetry. Shortly before the war, the symbolist's impetus was felt to have spent itself. There was a general dissatisfaction with the spirit which informed it. The poets, says a Russian critic, were tired of plumbing the ultimate depths of the soul and of daily ascending the Golgotha of mysticism. After the ecstasies came the desire for the ice-water of simplicity. No longer expressing mystery in music, the poets sought the limited, precise, concrete image. This movement manifested itself in the Acmeus Secession, grouped around a publishing firm known as the Guild of Poets, which has this year been revived. The Acmeus, or Atomists, led by Gumilyev, Akhmatova, and Gorodetsky, attacked symbolism to celebrate raw reality. Proclaiming the primitive vision of a Gauguin, they insisted on immediate contact with the tangible, visible, audible world. The coterie did not write much more than its manifesto, though its method may be discovered in a work of the later Imaginist, Imaginist group of which Yesinian and Mariengoff are representative members. 
these build their poetics upon the concept of the autonomous image regarded as the end of all poetry one of their number has recently declared that a poem must not be an organized entity but rather a succession of self-sufficient images moving as in dreams a sensational career awaited the other post symbolist development futurism it originated with the cubo futurists in moscow in 1911 and a year later the pietrograd ego futurists issued their manifesto the difference between them was rather like that between tweedledum and tweedledee the one hitting everything it could see when it got really excited the other hitting everything within reach whether it could see it or not they hit out less to epater le bourgeois than professedly to discard all the canons of art and to destroy toothless ratio their proclaimed desire was to raise the past and build the present on nothing their poetics provided for a language consisting of the elements having an audible and visual but no intellectual value this is merely an ideal which luckily for the rest of us their poetry does not always achieve let us gorge ourselves with the void says one of them the poetic gift can thrive even on this futile diet through their cacophony is sometimes heard the shrill and raucous voice of a machine-made age their distorted language occasionally mirrors a time which is out of joint and their violently eccentric imagery wrests new meaning from old commonplaces as in mayakovsky's line a bald lantern voluptuously takes off the blue stocking from the street naturally they resist translation except in the case of severyanin the early leader of the petrograd group whose work is however not typical futurism showed no great vitality and would probably have shared the fate of a fashion were it not for the revolution its unabashed iconoclasm its plebeian exuberance may account for its recent vogue its mannerisms are noticeable in the work of men who do not strictly adhere to the coterie such as oryeshin and mariengoff it is worth noting that the literature of the revolution is chiefly verse the surviving representatives of classicism and symbolism with the possible exception of andre bieli continue their work without developing it in addition to them and to the eruptions of the futurists there are the peasant poets headed by kluyev and a large body of workmen poets the revolution has extended the class principle to aesthetics and takes special pains to promote the literary expression of the masses yet proletarian verse is by no means a new phenomenon in russia from nineteen o eight to nineteen fifteen fifty volumes of such verse found their way into publication the crudity and naivete of the workman's poetry produced since the revolution is redeemed by a hard-handed grasp on reality the return to realism is the promise of a new development in russian poetry like all living things poetry endures only through change end of the introduction recording by kevin davidson www.blogordie.com Section 1 of Modern Russian Poetry, an Anthology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kevin Davidson. Modern Russian Poetry, an Anthology. Selected and translated by Babette Deutsch and Avram Yarolinsky. Alexander Pushkin, 1799 to 1837 alexander pushkin was born the last year of the eighteenth century he died at the age of byron within these thirty-seven years he crowded the activity of a great and authentic initiator in literature his mother's grandfather was a negro or an arab 
who, the story goes, was bought for Peter the Great at Constantinople for a bottle of rum, and who married a German. His father was descended from an ancient Russian family. The poet, inheritor of these curious strains, was educated chiefly by ineffectual French tutors and an old Russian nurse. At eighteen he graduated from an aristocratic school at Tsarskoye Selo, an indifferent scholar, but a writer with a reputation for light and lewd verse. The next three years he spent at the northern capital, where all the vices dance upon the knees of folly. He was nominally attached to the foreign office, but was chiefly sowing his wild oats. By his liberal velleities and merciless epigrams, he stung the authorities to the countercheck quarrelsome, and the enfant terrible was shipped south and subsequently to his own estate. During his not too disagreeable southern exile, he divided his time with persistent unfaithfulness between the maids and the muse. Back in Petersburg in 1826, he was lionized by the ladies and harassed by the censors. At thirty-two he married a girl nearly half his age, with the face of a Madonna and the soul of a brainless coquette. To provide for her needs, the poet worked feverishly, and that she might be received at court, he secured a court appointment. Financial cares and domestic worries soon saddened and aged him. He was destroyed by the aristocratic Philistines, whose good graces he half unwillingly sought. An intrigue involving Pushkin's wife and her brother-in-law, Baron Dante, Diantes, resulted in a duel in which the poet was mortally wounded at the age of thirty-seven. Pushkin's share of this volume is no indication of his relative significance in the advance of Russian poetry. He is an overshadowing figure, and his work is an essential part of Russia's literary endowment. Yet an anthology which is not primarily concerned with historic values, and which is addressed to a foreign audience, can present but a few of his facets to the reluctant light of a sophisticated intelligence. A Nereid Among the glaucous waves that kiss gold Taurus's beaches, I saw a Nereid, as dawn flushed heaven's reaches. I barely dared to breathe, hid in the olive trees, while the young demigoddess rose above the seas. Her young, her swan-white breast above the waters lifting, from her soft hair she wrung the foam in garlands drifting. Behold a sower went forth to sow. With freedom's seed, the desert sowing, I walked before the morning star, from pure and guiltless fingers throwing, where slavish plows had left a scar. The fecund seed, the procreator, O vain and sad disseminator, I learned then what lost labors are. Graze, if you will, you peaceful nations, Who never rouse at honor's horn. Should flocks heed freedom's invocations? Their part is to be slain or shorn, Their dower, the yoke their sires have worn, Through snug and sheepish generations. Three Springs Three springs in life's unbroken, joyless desert mysteriously issue from the sands. The spring of youth, uneven and rebellious, bears swift its sparkling stream through sunny lands. Life's exiles drink the wave of inspiration that swells the limpid fount of Castile, but tis the deep, cold wellspring of oblivion that slakes most sweetly thirst and ecstasy. The Prophet I dragged my flesh through desert gloom, tormented by the spirit's yearning, and saw a six-winged seraph loom upon the footpath's barren turning, and as a dream in slumber lies, so light his finger on my eyes, my wizard eyes grew wide and wary, an eagle startled from her eyrie, he touched my ears, and lo, a sea of storming voices burst on me, I heard the whirling heavens tremor, the angels' flight and soaring sweep, the sea-snakes coiling in the deep, the sap the vine's green tendrils carry, and to my lips the seraph clung, and tore from me my sinful tongue, my cunning tongue and idle worded, the subtle serpent's sting he set between my lips, his hand was wet, his bloody hand my mouth begirded, 
and with a sword he cleft my breast and took the heart with terror turning and in my gaping bosom pressed a coal that throbbed there black and burning upon the wastes a lifeless clod i lay and heard the voice of god arise o prophet watch and hearken and with my will thy soul engird through lands that dim and seas that darken burn thou men's hearts with this my word verses written during a sleepless night sleep i cannot find nor light everywhere is dark and slumber only weary tickings number the slow hours of the night parka jabbering woman fashion sleeping night without compassion life who stirs like rustling mice why encage me in thy vice why the whispering insistence art thou but the pale persistence of a day departed twice what black failures dost thou reckon dost thou prophesy or beckon i would know whence thou art sprung i would study thy dark tongue work here is the long bided hour the labor of years is accomplished why should this sadness unplumbed secretly weigh on my heart is it my work being done i stand like a laborer useless one who has taken his pay alien to unwanted tasks is it the work i regret the silent companion of midnight friend of the golden-haired dawn friend of the gods of the hearth madonna not by old masters rich on crowded walls my house i ever sought to ornament that gaping guests might marvel while they bent to connoisseurs with condescending drawls midst slow labors far from garish halls before one picture i would fain have spent eternity where the calm canvas thralls as though the virgin and our saviour lent from regnant clouds the glorious and the wise the meek and hallowed with unearthly eyes beneath the palm of zion these alone my wish is granted god has shown thy face to me here my madonna thou shalt throne most pure exemplar of the purest grace end of section one recording by kevin davidson www.blogordie.com section two of modern russian poetry an anthology Selected and translated by Babette Deutsch and Avram Yarmolinsky, this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Davidson. Yevgeny Baratinsky, 1800-1844 It is a little cup, but it is my own. Thus might Baratinsky sum up the small perfection of his art. He belonged to Pushkin's school, but was not eclipsed by the master his oeuvre consisted of one slender volume of lyrics these are marked by the originality of the discriminating eclectic by a strong conscience for form and by the obtruding intellection of a born pessimist like most of the russian literateurs of the first half of the nineteenth century with which he was born baratinsky belonged to the kept classes an infringement of the eighth commandment while he was at school the corps of pages reduced this son of a senator to a mere private the experience may have accented his gloomy temperament aside from this the outward circumstances of his life including his marriage were happy and therefore have no history his last years however were saddened by the consciousness of estrangement from the rising generation prayer king of heavens release my sick soul to its peace for the errors of earth send oblivion's dearth to thy stern paradise give my heart strength to rise alexey koltsov eighteen o nine to eighteen forty two koltsov might be best described as a tame burns the adjective applies to the poetry more than to the poet 
though even here we find a soberer man. He was a cattle dealer, and the son of a cattle dealer, a cross between a trader and a cowpuncher. He spent his life in the sordid surroundings of his native town, with the exception of a few visits to the two capitals. There he met the literati of the day, dinnered with lairds, and was stared at in fashionable salons. He returned with a swollen head, which caused him a great deal of misery at home. The effect of his intercourse with the intellectuals was seen to be equally lamentable in his attempts at philosophic poetry. His last years were embittered by poverty, neglect, and a tragic love which ended in a lurid disease. His art maintained his umbilical connection with the people. He carries on the tradition of the Russian folk-song, whether the stuff of his lyrics is the works and days of the peasant, or themes of universal emotional appeal. He uses the free rhythms of the folk-song, and, curiously enough, his favorite meter coincides with that of the Sophoclean choruses. Of his 124 poems, three-fourths have been set to music by some 100 Russian composers, among whom are Glinka and Rimsky-Korsakov. AN OLD MAN'S SONG I shall saddle a horse, a swift courser he, I shall fly, I shall rush, as the hawk is keen, Over fields, over seas, to a distant land, I shall overtake there my youth again, I shall make myself spruce, be a blade again, I shall make a fine show for the girls again, but alas, no road leads to the past we've left, and the sun will not rise for us in the west. Mikhail Yermentov, 1814-1841 Whether or not the semi-legendary Thomas of Erlsdun, who received his poetic gift from the fairies, was Lermontov's ancestor, it is certain that the Russian poet traced his lineage back to George Lermont of Scotland who settled in Russia in the seventeenth century. His grandchildren claimed that they were descended from that Lermont who fought with Malcolm against Macbeth. Lermontov's immediate heredity was rather poor. His hysterical mother died in 1817 when he was three years old, and he grew up as the bone of contention between his father and his wealthy, overbearing grandmother. On her estate the spoiled darling received his early education, of the usual imported type. He was extraordinarily precocious in both love and literature. Between 1828 and 1832 he had written three hundred lyrics, fifteen long narrative poems, and three dramas. He was little more than a boy when he graduated from a military college at St. Petersburg, having previously spent two years at the University of Moscow, and plunged into a life of poetry drowned in champagne. His technique as a heartbreaker was only excelled by his power as a poet, and that in spite of a repellent exterior. Upon Pushkin's death, Lermontov's obituary poem brought him rapid fame and exile in the Caucasus. This region was to the poets of Russia what Italy had been to those of England. The romantic glamour of the enchanted land suffused Lermontov's work, one of his flames called him a Prometheus chained to the rocks of the Caucasus, but he was more like a pendulum swinging between them and the beau monde of St. Petersburg. He indulged inordinately in the sadness of sarcasm, and was as well hated by the men as he was loved by the women. Spared by the bullets of the mountaineers, Lermontov was killed in a duel with an outraged colleague only a year older at his death than was John Keats. Yet this brilliant bully and egotist rake was, after his own fashion, a knight of the Holy Grail and a poetic genius such as rarely graces any language. THE ANGEL Through the heavens of midnight an angel was sped who lifted his chant as he fled. The moon and the clouds and the stars leaned to hear the song rising holy and clear. He sang of the spirits, the sinless, the blessed, who softly in paradise rest. Of the gardens of God and of God was his song, 
ringing true as a heavenly gong he bore a young soul to the dark gates of birth toward the travailing sorrowful earth and flying he sang and the eager soul heard the deathless the unuttered word and the years in the world could but sadden and tire the soul filled with wondrous desire and vainly the dull songs of earth would have stilled the song wherewith heaven had thrilled the cup of life we drink life's cup with thirsty lips our eyes shut fast to fears about the golden rim there drips our staining blood our tears but when the last swift hour comes on the light long hid is lit from startled eyes the band is gone we suffer and submit it is not our part to possess the cup that golden gleamed we see its shallow emptiness we did not drink we dreamed gratitude for all i thank thee i the meek remitter for passion's secret torments without end the kiss of venom and the tears too bitter the vengeful enemy the slanderous friend the spirit's ardor on the desert squandered for every lash of life's deceiving thong i thank thee for the wastes where i have wandered but heed thou that i need not thank thee long from the demon part one fifteen on the sightless sea of ether rudderless without a sail choirs of stars uplift their voices where the mist waves rise and fail through the hemless fields of heaven wander wide and tracelessly clouds unshepherded unnumbered pale ephemeral and free hour of parting hour of meeting neither gladden them nor fret there's no yearning toward the future there's no haunting of regret on the grim day of disaster these remember worlds away be beyond earth's reach as these are and indifferent as they captive night silent i sit by the prison's high window where through the bars the blue heavens are breaking flecks of the azure the free birds are playing watching them fly there my shamed heart is aching but on my sinful lips never a prayer never a song in the praise of my charmer all i recall are far fights and old battles my heavy sword and my old iron armor now in stone armor i helplessly languish and a stone helmet my hot head encases this shield is proof against arrows and sword-play and without whip without spur my horse races time is my horse the swift galloping charger and for a visor this bleak prison grating walls of my prison are heavy stone armor shielded by cast-iron doors i am waiting hurry o oh fast-flying time fly more quickly in my new armor i faint i am choking I shall alight with death holding my stirrup, then my cold face from this visor uncloaking. End of section two. Recording by Kevin Davidson. www.blogordie.com Section three of Modern Russian Poetry, an Anthology. Selected and translated by Babette Deutsch and Avram Yarmolinsky. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Davidson. Fyodor Tchuchev, 1803 to 1873. Tchuchev was rediscovered by the moderns and hailed as the great forerunner. They found in his mentality and sensibility, as well as in his technique, elements foreign to classic normalcy and akin to their own anguished metaphysics and aesthetics the two hundred short lyrics which are all the original poetry he has left us exhibit the organic coherence and ordered beauty which belong to fine lyric art the originality of his poems consists 
in that both man's routine passions and nature's passionless routine are sensed in ultimate cosmic terms. Tyutchev's career could not be inferred from his poetry. This was the by-product of a long and largely conventional life. He was a sedate bureaucrat in the diplomatic service, a position which kept him in München, the German Athens, during his best years. He proved the happiness of his marriage to a Bavarian aristocrat by marrying again shortly after her death. When he was on the shady side of fifty, his career was seriously injured by a liaison with his daughter's teacher. During the last twenty years of his life he acted as censor, a position for which his political views eminently fitted him. He believed in autocracy, and he prophesied that Orthodox Russia, at the head of the United Slavs, would be the sacred ark riding the waves of the Western Revolutionary Deluge. Twilight Soft the dove-hued shadows mingle, color fades, sound droops to sleep. Life and motion melt to darkness, swaying murmurs far and deep. But the night moss languid flitting stirs the air invisibly. O oh, the hour of wordless longing, I in all, and all in me. Twilight, tranquil, brooding twilight, coarse through me, serene and smooth, quiet, languid, fragrant twilight, flood all depths, all sorrows soothe, every sense in dark and cooling self-forgetfulness immerse, grant that I may taste extinction in the dreaming universe. As Ocean's Stream As Ocean's Stream girdles the ball of earth, from circling seas of dream man's life emerges, and as night moves in silence up the firth, the secret tide around our mainland surges. The voice of urgent water softly sounds, the magic skiff uplifts white wings of wonder, the tide swells swiftly, and the white sail rounds where the blind waves in shoreless darkness thunder and the wide heavens starred and luminous out of the deep in mystery aspire the strange abyss is burning under us and we sail onward and our wake is fire silentium be silent hidden and conceal whate'er your dream whate'er you feel O oh, let your visions rise and die Within your heart's unfathomed sky, Like stars that take night's darkened root, Admire and scan them, and be mute. The heart was born dumb, Who can sense its tremors recondite and tense, And who can hear its silent cry? A thought when spoken is a lie, Uncovered springs men will pollute, drink hidden waters and be mute your art shall inner living be the world within your fantasy a kingdom is that waits its saul the outer din shall still its call day's glare its secret suns confute o oh, quaff its singing and be mute autumn evening the light of autumn evenings seems a screen, Some mystery with tender glamour muffling. The trees in motley, cloaked in eerie sheen, The scarlet leaves that languid airs are ruffling. The still and misty azure, vaguely far, Above the earth that waits her orphan sorrow, And bitter winds in gusty vagrants are, Forerunners of a bleak, storm-driven morrow. The woods are waning, withered is the sun, Earth shows the smile of fading, Meekly tender as the high shyness of a suffering one In noble reticence of sad surrender. July 14 at night Not yet cooled, the windless night of July shone strangely still, Earth lay dim and fitful light, in the skyey, storm-filled height, trembled over field and hill. 
so might lidded eyes unclose and between vast lashes burn glances flaming and morose over earth's remote repose mute as lightning swift and stern o thou my wizard soul o thou my wizard soul o heart that whelming agony immerses the threshold of two universes in cleaving these tears thee apart and so two alien worlds are thine thy day of morbid passionate living thy sleep vague revelations giving of spirit secret and divine then let the tortured bosom beat with fatal passion and vagary the soul is fain even as merry to cling forever to christ's feet nikolai nekrasov eighteen twenty one to eighteen seventy seven nekrasov's literary career began with a series of prose potboilers written while he was starving in st petersburg he had come to this city as a boy of seventeen in eighteen thirty eight to follow the military profession against the will of his father a brute of an oberau the young man preferred the university to the army and was forthwith thrown on his own resources a penniless hack he became before long a popular poet and the thriving publisher of two of the greatest radical monthlies in russia as a child he had heard the bitter songs of the volga barge towers in the capital he had lived with filth and famine he introduced these elements into his work yet though he suffered with the people in his poems he enjoyed his prosperity in spite of ethical scruples his work is marked with a strong social and civic preoccupation he declared that his interest interfered with his poetry as a matter of fact his muse of vengeance and wrath was an uncertain creature he threw untransmuted into his poetry the raw stuff of satire and feuilleton of parody and pamphlet at his best he could move the reader with his stinging pity and his passionate self-scorn he is perhaps chiefly remembered by his epic who lives happily in russia which holds in its vast frame the very essence of the misery and the thwarted vigor of the russian peasant the capitals are rocked with thunder the capitals are rocked with thunder of orators in wordy feuds but in the depths of russia yonder an age-old awful silence broods only the wind in wayside willows coming and going does not cease and cornstalks touch in curving billows the earth that cherishes and pillows through endless fields of changeless peace my poems witnesses of unavailing my poems witnesses of unavailing tears for the sad earth shed born in the moment when the soul is failing and by the storm winds bred against men's hearts you beat with wistful wailing like waves on cliffs as dead the salt song from who can live happily in russia god's will be done no food he'll try the youngest son look he will die a crust i got another bit he touched it not put salt on it of salt no shred no pinch i see take flour instead god whispered me two bites or one his mouth he pouts the little son more salt he shouts the bit appears again all flowered and wet with tears it was devoured the mother said she'd saved her dear salt was the bread how salt the tear end of section three Recording by Kevin Davidson, www.blogordie.com. Section 4 of Modern Russian Poetry and Anthology. Selected and translated by Babette Deutsch and Avram Yarmolinsky. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Davidson. Alexei K. Tolstoy, 1817-1875 Alexei Tolstoy was a playmate of Alexander II and sat on the knees of Goethe. Like Ruskin, he made a cult of beauty, humanitarianism, and Italy. 
In this second fatherland of his he began to travel in early life. His coterie esthete was mystic, with a leaning towards the occult. He regarded the doctrine of equality as the foolish invention of 1793, and was wholly out of sympathy with the materialistic iconoclasts of his time, yet he was too much of an aristocrat not to despise despotism. His literary activity began in his middle years. His romantic interest in the Russian past produced a novel and a dramatic trilogy. The past is also a playground of Tolstoy's poetry. This frequently degenerates into pastiche. Nevertheless, he was a major poet among the minor poets, at his best achieving a neat and graceful lyricism. His technique is unusual in Russian poetry for its prosaic freedom. MY LITTLE ALMOND TREE My little almond tree is gay with gleaming bloom. My heart unwillingly puts forth its buds of gloom. The bloom will leave the tree, the fruit unbidden grow, and the green boughs will be by bitter loads brought low. A WELL AND THE CHERRY TREES SWAYING A WELL and the cherry trees swaying where bare girlish feet trod the fruit nearby the damp imprint betraying the stamp of a heavy nailed boot still now is the place of their meeting but nothing the silence avails in my brain passion's echo repeating their whispers the splash of the pails oh the ricks Oh, the ricks, the ricks, in the meadows lying, the eye cannot count you for all its trying. Oh, the ricks, the ricks, in the green morasses, what do you guard, you heaped heavy masses? Pray behold us, good sir, we were once bright flowers, but the sharp scythe falls, and the whole field cowers. We were littered here, all mown down and shattered on the meadowland from each other scattered we have no defence evil guests come clawing and upon our crests perch the black crows cawing on our head they perch the starred heavens dimming hear the jackdaws flock their foul hutches trimming o oh, thou eagle hail our far father flying o oh, thou fire-eyed come our bleak foes defying O oh, thou eagle, hail! Lo, our groans grow stronger. Let the evil crows blacken us no longer. O oh, avenge us, swift, from the heavens swooping. Punish their vile pride till their wings fall drooping. Till the feathers fly, come a bolt of thunder that the steppe's wild wind tear them all asunder. Apollon Mykoff 1821 to 1897 born of a mother with a literary leaning and an aristocratic father who gave up the military career for that of a painter mykoff himself was a sculptor who lost his way in literature he studied painting in his youth and indeed his poems show a clear sense of line and color but his best work is marked by a truly sculptural quality he received a thorough classical education, and in his early work he imitated the Greek and Roman masters. Generally speaking, he yields all too easily to the indirections of erudition and to the protean pleasures of promiscuous translation. It is in the classical genre that he achieves a small excellence. His finest craftsmanship is shown in enamels and cameos, and in clay medallions, but he has neither the paganism of Gautier nor the sensitive sophistication of Regnier. Mykoff's is a baptized pan and a feigning Bacchus. His later work was dominated by a nationalistic bias which opposed the chosen Russian people to the rotten West. A typical esthete, Mykoff found himself in the conservative camp. For nearly half a century he served his monarch as a censor. The antimony of East and West, 
of Christianity and paganism, viewed with a cold objectivity, superseded his interest in the antique world. This is the pivotal idea of his greatest narrative poem, The Tragedy of the Two Worlds. Art Idly I cut me a reed by the shore where the sea heaves and thunders. Dumb and forgotten it lay in my simple, my wind-beaten cabin. Once an old traveller passed who remained for the night in our dwelling, far in his dress and his tongue, an old man who was strange to our region. Seeing the reed he retrieved it, and lopping and piercing the nodules, sweetly his lips he applied to the holes that he fashioned responding swiftly the reed voice awoke till the noise of the sea breathed within it thus would wild zephyros blow were he suddenly ruffling the waters fingering lightly the reed stems and flooding the banks with the sea sound upon this wild headland Upon this wild headland, crowned meanly with indigent rushes, and withering bush, and the pitiful green of the pine trees, the aged Meniscus, a sorrowful fisherman, laid his son who had perished, his youth the sea, mother-wise, nurtured, that sea whose wide lap took him back, who resistlessly bore him in death, and who carefully carried the young body shoreward. Then morning Meniscus went forth, and beneath the great willow he dug him a grave, a plain stone he set for a mark on the cliff-side, and hung overhead a coarse net he had woven of willow, a fisherman's wreath to be poverty's bitter memento. SUMMER RAIN Golden rain, golden rain, out of the sky, children sing out and run after the rain, Quiet, my children, we'll reap it again, only we'll gather the gold in the grain, in the full granaries fragrant with rye. Afanasi Shenshin Foth, 1820-1892 It is said that Foth, like the nightingale, sang only at dawn and at sunset. Between 1840 and 1856 he published three volumes of poetry, the following two decades he devoted to the pleasures and profits of a gentleman farmer. He waxed fat and prosperous. His famous apple cakes were sent to no less a friend than Alexander the Third. On the road to the ripe old age of threescore and ten, the poet superseded the pomistic and paid court to the muse with four volumes of verse. Although an admirer and translator of Schopenhauer, Foth enjoyed the distinction of being one of the few men who were actually happy in Russia. He had an Horatian serenity, and the esthete's indifference to society's ills. These elements in his character alone are reflected in his poetry, which is written in major, yet has withal the ethereal, insubstantial quality of dream experience. His lyrics are invested with a rarefied sensuousness, a keen feeling for life's cosmic content, and a dominating interest in melody. Tchaikovsky, who has set many of his poems to music, likened Foth to Beethoven. Whispers, Timid Breathing Whispers, timid breathing, trilling of a nightingale, heaving silver waters rilling in the quiet vale, night's dim light and shadows dreaming, through the haze of space, moods like fairy lanterns gleaming on the dearest face. Smoky clouds show roses sleeping, amber lights and fawn, kisses soft and softer weeping, and the dawn, the dawn. THE AERIAL CITY at daybreak there spread through the heavens pale clouds like a turreted town. The cupolas, golden, fantastic, white roofs and white walls shining down. This citadel is my white city, my city familiar and dear, above the dark earth as it slumbers, upon the pink sky builded clear. And all that aerial city sails northward, sails softly, sails high, and there on the height someone beckons, 
but proffers no pinions to fly. Swallows Calm nature's idle spy I follow, enjoy her pathways free and fond. I watch the arrow-winged swift swallow who curves above the dusking pond. It dashes forward, lightly skimming the glassy surface, half in fear of alien clutching waters, dimming the lightning wings before they veer. And once again the same quick daring, and once again the same dark stream. Is not this flight our human faring? Is not this urge our human dream? Thus I, frail vessel, am forbidden to take the foreign road, and dip to scoop a drop the ways are hidden of alien streams I may not sip. End of section four. Recording by Kevin Davidson. www.bloggerdie.com Section five of Modern Russian Poetry An Anthology. Selected and translated by Babette Deutsch and Avram Yarmolinsky. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Davidson. Yakov Polonsky, eighteen nineteen to eighteen ninety eight. The routine of Polonsky's uneventful life was compounded of teaching, editorial work, and long years of service in the censorship department. It is true that he traveled abroad and spent some years in the Caucasus, but this did not interrupt the even tenor of his ways. He was a prolific fiction writer, yet it is as a poet that he lives in the memory of his compatriots. His poetry itself has been charged with being lukewarm and neither hot nor cold. It lacks, it has been said, that cosmic nostalgia and civic consciousness which belongs to Russian poetry. Indeed, Polonsky's poetic effigy is rather unheroic and indistinct in outline. Yet he has the virtues of his defects. His work is distinguished by its homeliness. It keeps to the lighted circle of our familiar and familial life, and foregoes power and passion for intimacy and charm. THE COSMIC FABRIC this vast web of nature's weaving is God's garment, so tis said. In that fabric I a living, I a still unbroken thread. And the threads run swiftly, never halting, yet if once they sever, seer or sage shall not suffice, then the parted strands to splice. For the weaver so will veil them, that, let him who may bewail them, none the ends shall ever find, nor one broken thread rebind. Ceaselessly the threads are breaking, short, ah, short will be my span. Meanwhile, at his fabric's making, toils the cosmic artisan, Curious patterns still designing, Wave and crested hill defining, Step and pasture, cloud and sky, Wood and field of golden rye. Though with care the wise may scan it, Flawless since that hand began it, Smooth and fine with fair accord Shines the garment of the Lord. Sorrow's Madness when clinging to your lidded coffin, I saw you, love, on your last journey go. My sobs, my maddened heart, could soften, And I seemed dead like you below. Yours was the grave men see so often, Your small frame fitted snugly so, With leaden stupor blinded. I beheld it vanish, I heard the clods soft blow. 
my coffin was not thus but spacious and gay with leaves and a blue pall in state and fastened to it glared the sun of midday a gilded gaudy coffin plate your coffin disappeared beneath wet earth and gravel but mine alas still glittered mockingly an orphaned soul and widowed i let my sad eyes travel about me my heart's heart and i could see how buried deep in my resplendent coffin and bearing death within me i would sue for happiness now lost forever i knew my nothingness my thirst for you i longed to break the spell of numbness lay waste my living tomb wrench back its bars to tear aside the grave clothes of the heavens to stamp upon the sun and scatter wide the stars and dash across this endless graveyard where dead worlds fill the graves to find your dwelling where no memories languish to death's void galley chained like sullen slaves vladimir solovyov eighteen fifty three to nineteen hundred coming from a family of scholars and churchmen solovyov was himself a mystic and visionary an alien seed in an exorcised age he was a cross between a bohemian and a lay monk whose asceticism only emphasized his powerfully erotic nature a spirit dedicated to the creation of the greatest philosophical system which russia has given to the world was fain to express itself also in poetry his one slender volume of lyrics has the quality of soaring spirituality and is generally engaged with a supersensuous reality occasionally broken by eruptions of spasmodic comedy it is largely centered about the concept of the eternal feminine which also plays an important part in his grandiose religious system he conceives it not as aphrodite but rather as sophia divine wisdom the feminine principle materialized itself for the mystic in a dantesque experience in a reminiscential poem written eight years before his death he relates how as a boy of nine he first glimpsed his eternal mate this was in moscow he next sees her in the reading-room of the british museum thirteen years later as he bends over volumes of abstruse mystical literature she bids him follow her to egypt it is a biographic fact that the young docent travelled across the continent to cairo and went afoot into the desert where he beheld his beatific vision for the last time below the sultry storm below the sultry storm that seemed to lower an alien force again i heard the call of my mysterious mate the prisoned power of old dreams flared and flickered in its fall and with a cry of horror and of dolor as of an eagle in an iron vice my spirit shook its cage in quivering choler and tore the net and issued to the skies and up behind the clouds unswerving bearing before the miracles of flaming sea within the shining sanctum briefly flaring it vanished into white infinity with wavering feet with wavering feet i walked where dawn-lit mists were lying to find the shores of wonder and of mystery dawn struggled with the final stars frail dreams were flying while unto unknown gods my morning lips were crying the prayers that my dream imprisoned soul had whispered me the noon is cold and candid the road winds on severely and through an unknown land once more my journey lies the mist has lifted now and the stark eye sees clearly how hard the mountain road that rises upward sheerly how distant looms the dream the prescient heart decries yet onward with unfaltering feet i shall be going toward midnight onward toward the shore of my desires where on a mountain height new stars its glory showing my promised temple waits with plinth and pillar glowing 
beaten about with flame of white triumphal fires. N. Minsky, pseudonym of Nikolai Vilenkin, born 1855. The son of poor Jewish villagers, Minsky was, among other things, tutor, lawyer, and bank employee before he emigrated to Paris in 1905 at the age of 50, where he has lived as newspaper correspondent and littérateur ever since. He had previously lived abroad and was abreast of European literary movements. His ideological and poetic career has been no less kaleidoscopic beginning as a poet insistent upon civic virtues and art as criticism of life within some ten years minsky became the prophet of amoralism decadence symbolism and the champion of bacchic beauty early in the twentieth century he joined with sophisticated orthodox priests and lay god-seekers in founding a society for the promotion of a new religious consciousness himself preaching a nebulously negative mystic doctrine of meonism, affectionately envisioning a new nirvana. The revolution of 1905 inspired his muse briefly to Marxian hymns and helped him in his Parisian exile. Here, in addition to his other work, he wrote a dramatic trilogy. Minsky had a weakness for manifestos, of which his poetry was not always a successful illustration. It is only his later work, with its increased technical skill, that achieves the bodying forth of his curious intellection. Force She lies, opening her teats, strong, swollen, wide, and at her breasts their equal gift bestowing, mad Nero and meek Buddha clutch, unknowing, as clinging twins who suckle side by side. She holds two vessels whence, forever flowing, the streams of life and death serenely glide. She breathes, and wreaths of stars are lit and bide. She breathes anew, they fly like sere leaves blowing. She looks ahead with cold unseeing eyes. She cares not, though she bear or cause to perish, the children whom she nourishes she will cherish, but when she weans them, every claim denies. Evil and good gather them in thereafter, and play the cosmic game with idle laughter. My Temple Who rears a temple rears two monuments his own and the destroyers, they who build, except Herostratos' arbitraments, and to the torch the chisel's work is willed, both will stand firm before posterity, and equal glory fame to each will lend, but thou, my air-domed temple, shall not be mocked by the vengeance of the general end. On an abyss of ruin is thy lease, Thou art the furnace of negation fired, in thee the hymns of solace shall not cease. With sorrow winged by calm despair, inspired, thee legioned sufferings guard in iron mail, and in their vanguard death who shall prevail. Dmitri Meryshkovsky, born 1865 Mirishkovsky had every opportunity of study and travel afforded the son of a comfortably circumstanced bureaucratic family. He made his pilgrimage to the seats of the antique Mediterranean culture, and the Parthenon brought him, like Renan, to his knees. Yet this devout and learned Hellenist is much of a lay theologian, he has constructed a professedly mystical but actually rationalistic religion which dominates all his work. The synthesis of paganism and Christianity, of flesh and spirit, which is his religion of the Third Testament, is the Procrustean bed of both his brilliant criticism and his vast historical novels. In the latter his method is chiefly that of a historical mosaicist, his trilogy is accessible to the English reader, as well as some of his critical work, notably a part of his remarkable study on Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. His prose forms the bulk of his writings. As a poet, 
Mierzkowski was one of the initiators of the modernist movement, but he counts mainly as the champion of their poetics. His own lyrical work is largely ineffectual and imitative of men as curiously alien to him as Baudelaire, Poe, and Nietzsche. Against a background of melancholy pieces expressing metaphysical ennui and cold intellection, one finds some poems informed with spiritual beauty and religious intensity. A Prayer Cast prostrate in mourning, wingless self-scorning, grief in a gust, flings us, dust upon dust. We desire not, we dare not. We believe not, we care not. No wisdom has worth. God, do thou dower us, kindle, empower us, give of thy mirth from the languor that clings. Give us wings, give us wings, wings of thy spirit. The Trumpet Call Over earth awakes a whirring, and a rustling and a stirring trumpet voices fill the skies lo they call us brothers rise no the darkness holds unshaken i will sleep and not awaken do not rouse me do not call do not strike the coffin wall now you dare not sleep resounding sternly the last trump is sounding they are rising from the tomb, as from the maternal womb of the opened earth, forth flinging from their graves the dead are springing. No, I cannot, all unuttered, my words died. My eyes are shuttered, I shall not believe their lies. I shall not, I cannot rise. Brother, I am ashamed and shrinking, dust, corruption, rotting, stinking. Brother, God has seen our prison. All shall wake, and all be risen. All shall yet be judged by him, cherubim and seraphim. High the holy throne are bearing, here our heavenly king is faring. Brother, he must live who dies, glad or grieving, thou shalt rise. THE CURSE OF LOVE With heavy anguish, hopeless straining, the bonds of love I would remove, Oh, to be loosed from their enchaining, O oh, freedom, only not to love. The soul that shame and fear are scourging Crawls through a mist of dust and blood. From dust, great God, my spirit purging, O oh, spare me from love's bitter flood. Is pity's wall alone unshaken? I pray to God, I cry in vain. More weary, by all hope forsaken, resistless love grows great again. There is no freedom unforgiven. We live as slaves by life consumed. We perish, tortured, bound, and driven, promised to death and to love doomed. End of section five. Recording by Kevin Davidson. www.blogordie.com. Section 6 of Modern Russian Poetry, an Anthology, selected and translated by Babette Deutsch and Avram Yarmolinsky. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Davidson. Fyodor Sologup, pseudonym of Fyodor Tichernikov, born 1863. In Sologup, the sick fantast thumbed his nose at the respectable schoolmaster. One would expect neither in the son of a tailor and a peasant woman, who had grown up in the house where his widowed mother was a servant. For ten years after his graduation from normal school, the young man taught in the provinces, learning to know the main streets of Russia, which were to furnish the stuff of his prose. At the age of twenty-nine he transplanted himself to St. Petersburg, where his uncanny verse and short stories gave him the entree to the modernist circle. In 1907 he retired from pedagogy and devoted himself entirely to literature. A few years later his complete works were published in twenty volumes, five of which were poetry, the remainder fiction and drama. He is a stay-at-home and has remained one, the revolution notwithstanding. 
If Sologub did not exist, it would be necessary to invent him. The decadent gesture, which was a pose or a purpose in others, is his natural attitude. He sees the universe as a ghastly menagerie in which the beasts have become wanted to their own stench. From this he escapes to a world of impossible imaginings and fills his isolation with liturgies to his own ego, hymns to the devil, hosannas to death. His unearthly world is fevered with fleshy lusts. In his lucid moments, however, he achieves the charm of a Blake-like innocence, and his hemlock is mixed with the honey of an enchanting music. His poetry is the core of his work. His prose is fantastic and poe-esque, yet in one work at least, notably The Little Demon, he follows the Russian realistic tradition of revealing human nature's repugnant depths. THE AMPHORA in a gay jar upon his shoulder the slave morosely carries wine his road is rough with bog and boulder and in the sky no starlights shine into the dark with stabbing glances he peers his careful steps are slow lest on his breast as he advances the staining wine should overflow i bear my amphora of sorrow long brimming with the wine it hides their poison for each waiting morrow ferments within the painted sides i follow secret ways and hidden to guard the evil vessel lest a careless hand should pour unbidden its bitterness upon my breast the dragon evil dragon in the zenith fiercely glowing filaments of flame across the heavens throwing singeing all the valley with the heat that scorches from the deep dark quiver i will pluck an arrow tipped with subtle poison that shall find thy marrow all too early flourish my triumphal torches i shall draw my bow in valiant retribution i executor of ruthless execution and thy groaning answer my glad ears shall cherish as i speed a sudden doom long overhanging and the arrow whizzes with a brazen twanging thou shalt fade thou evil dragon thou shalt perish when heaving on the stormy waters when heaving on the stormy waters i felt my ship begin to sink i prayed o oh, father satan save me forgive me at death's utter brink if you will save my soul embittered from perishing before its hour the days to come the nights that follow i vow to vice i pledge to power the devil forthwith snatched and flung me into a boat the sides were frail but on the bench the oars were lying and in the bow an old gray sail and landward once again i carried my outcast soul bereft of kin upon its sickly vicious sojourn my body and its gift of sin and i am faithful father satan unto my evil hours vow when from my drowning ship you saved me and when i prayed you guide the prow to you descend my praises father no day from bitter blame exempt o'er worlds my blasphemy shall tower and i shall tempt and i shall tempt austere the music of my songs austere the music of my songs the echo of sad utterance fills them a bitter breath far wafted chills them and is my back not bent to thongs the mists of day on darkness fall the vainly promised land i follow upon a road the shadows swallow the world rears round me like a wall at times from that far land the vain faint voice will sound like distant thunder can long abeyance of a wonder obliterate the long bleak pain the devil's swings below a pine's rough shadow where loud the river sings the hairy-handed devil pushes his devilish swings he swings and gives a crow to and fro to and fro the boards creak bending low the taut rope rubbing slow against the heavy boughs the board sways back and bracing 
with a long creek swings wide the devil still grimacing guffaws and holds his side i tremble to let go to and fro to and fro i sway and cling but no my languid glances grow fast where the devil toes above the looming pine the blue fiends sniggers sting you found the swing so fine well devil take you swing below the shaggy pine they squeak and whirl and sling you found the swing so fine well devil take you swing the fiend will not release the board that hangs too steep till i am thrust toward peace by the dark hand's dread sweep until the hemp turns round too long and is worn free until the broad black ground comes flying up to me above the pine i'll fling and bore into the mire then swing devil swing higher 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 zenaida gipius madame dmitri merzhikovsky born eighteen sixty nine poetry is not woman's work in russia zinaida gipius the wife of dmitri merzhikovsky is one of the few who carry it on she has written a great deal of bad fiction some partisan criticism rather indifferent dramas and her poetry is not unexceptional soon after her literary marriage she joined the petersburg symbolists and with her husband was one of the founders of the religious philosophical society a weakness for religious discussion and a theosophic bias have done much damage to both her prose and her verse her later poetry however is interesting as the expression of her difficult and distinctive personality she has the quality of burning ice hiding under contemptuous ennui her passion for the impossible in any event she is a virtuoso of verse whose mastery of tone color and metric pattern is wholly admirable she is at present engaged together with her husband in writing hymns of hate against the bolsheviki from the bitter security of the diaspora i seek for rhythmic whisperings i seek for rhythmic whisperings where noises bandy for life i listen wistfully in footless banter i cast wide nets and tentative in lakes of sorrow i go toward final tenderness by pathways sordid i look for dewdrops glistering in false hoods gardens i save truth's globules glistening from dust heaps garnered i fain would fathom a fortitude through years of wormwood and pierce the mortal fortless yet live a worldling my cup through ways impassable to bear untainted by tenebrous bleak passages to joy attaining psyche a shameless thing of every vileness capable it is as drab as dust as earthly dust i perish of a nearness inescapable its fatal coils about my limbs are thrust a shaggy pulp embracing me and pricking me as a serpent cold against my heart its branching scales are poisoned arrows sticking me worse than their bite repulsion's horrid smart oh were its sting a veritable knife in me but it is flaccid clumsy still and numb thus sluggishly sucking the very life in me a torpid dragon dreadful deaf and dumb with stubborn rings it winds in mute obscurity and clings carelessly its purpose whole and this dead thing this loathsome black impurity this horror that i shrink from is my soul creation thou queen of all serenity soul of my soul most chaste i summon thee divinity i summon thee make haste but to the tryst thy offering shall not be brought alone my guilt will come my suffering my sin will lift its moan before thy heart insulted so in shame my head will sink and i who once exalted so my humble tears shall drink forgive me that diurnity is all my love could dower that not for all eternity i made thee for an hour 
alone my will hath kindled here thy being from the void and thou shalt soon have dwindled here by my soul will destroyed as i thou shalt grow tremulous till all my strength is gone to fall of silence emulous into oblivion end of section 6 recording by kevin davidson www.blogordie.com Section 7 of Modern Russian Poetry, an Anthology, selected and translated by Babette Deutsch and Avram Yarbolinsky. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Davidson. Constantin Balmont, born 1867. Balmont revived the tradition of the wandering minstrel. He traveled more widely than the old-fashioned troubadour and also more comfortably. His journeys carried him to Mexico and Egypt, to India and the South Seas, and winds from these exotic lands blow through his songs. His stay abroad was somewhat of an exile, as certain political poems written in 1906 barred him from Russia. This was a recrudescence of youthful political ardor which in his student years sent him to prison for a short time, but which burned itself out early. He returned home in 1913, where he remained through the war and the revolution, till in 1920 he shook the dust of communism from his feet. Of late years his reputation, which was enormous about a decade ago, has been on the wane, yet his place as a great poet and as a leader of Russian modernism is assured to him in the opinion of his compatriots. He brought to Russian literature a spontaneous lyricism and a didacticism of joy, which, while emancipating poetry from its gloom and social bias, failed of intensity, imagery, and intellection. What impressed his public was his vociferous asceticism and a prolific versatility in subject matter. He has certainly contributed to the language by his rhythmic inventions, his range includes poems about the colors, children's verse, abstruse mythology, adaptations of Russian folk songs and spells, hymns to the elements, and above all, pure lyrics. He is a veritable narcissus of the ink-pot, to use a bon mot of Chuchev's. The hymn to fire is given here not for its quality, but solely as a typical example of Balmont's manner. He has done a rare service to Russian letters by translating the poetry of many languages, including the Scandinavian. He has practically made an anthology of English verse, and also gave to Russia a partial Whitman and a complete Shelley. Like Ezra Pound, he takes pleasure in flouting an obscure linguistic erudition. His fecundity, one fears, has survived most of his other faculties. WITH MY FANCY I GRASPED With my fancy I grasped at the vague shadows straying, at the vague shadows straying where the daylight had fled. I ascended a tower, and the stairway was swaying, and the stairway was swaying underneath my light tread. And the higher I climbed, Ever clearer were rounded, ever clearer were rounded, dreaming hilltops aglow, and from heaven to earth twilight voices resounded, twilight voices resounded from above and below. And the higher I rose, strange horizons defining, strange horizons defining, did the summits appear, and my eyes as I looked were caressed by their shining were caressed by their shining, their farewell, sad and clear. Now the night had appeared, earth in darkness lay dreaming, earth in darkness lay dreaming like a slumbering star, while the smoldering sun, his dim embers still gleaming, his dim embers still gleaming, shone for me from afar. I had learned to ensnare the vague shadows far straying, the vague shadows far straying where the daylight had fled. Ever higher I rose, and the stairway was swaying, and the stairway was swaying underneath my light tread. 
Centuries of centuries will pass. Long centuries of centuries will pass, unsighted millenniums, as locusts in deathly clouds descend, and in the muttering of centuries affrighted, the same enduring firmament will watch the end, the dumb dead firmament that God will not remember. Who breathes eternity behind the farther skies, beyond the fading of the last star's last slow ember? Beyond the utter threshold, words may scrutinize, forever cold, that starry desert, clouds out-topping, is flung forth, alien to the end, on space, when tearing comet fires will crumble with it, dropping as dumbly burning tears from a despairing face. In the White Land The candid psalm of silence rises whitely burning, the icy wastes are lit with sunset's radiant yearning. The drowsy elements in yawning vistas freeze, and voiceless are the argent polar liturgies. Above the sea of whiteness crimson curtains falling, no fields or forests here, clear crystal shines appalling. White altars stretch beneath the changeless icy skies, a prayer not suppliant, a psalm, not voiced, arise. Hymn to Fire 1. O fire who purgeth us in fate kindled strife, thy beauty ruleth us, shining with life. 2. Still and meek in the glow of a taper in church, but in riot, tumultuous tongued, unmoved by wild prayers, multi faced, shot with colour in walls overthrown, mad with passion, and nimble and gay, so triumphantly beautiful that my eyes are alight with the joy. Though thou feed on my own, O fair fire, all my dreams are devoted to thee. Three. Eternally changeful, thou art protean-faced, thou art smokily crimson in the bonfire's roar, thou art as a flower of terror with petals of flame, a bright mane of radiant hair, in the tumultuous flame of a taper thou burnst, first in blue, then in shuddering gold, in the silence of midsummer lightnings thou wakest, burning coldly in the storm-burdened clouds eerily livid and dark in the thunder that crashes the chanting of rain thou art writ in the lightning's brief hieroglyphs in a quick broken flash or long mighty shaft now a ball with nimbus of air all aglow where the swift running gold is with scarlet besprent thou art in the crystal of stars in the comet's strong urge sun sent Thou dost enter the chambers of plants with the gift of a quickening warmth. Thou workest, thou wakest the secret of sap, flaming up in a scarlet carnation, pale gold in the whispering corn, or carelessly flung in a lie the drunken vine. Thou art lying in wait as a spark in the night, so thou leapest elate, thou art still in thy flight, soon thy glow will abate but alive thou art great, than thy beauty is nothing more strange or more bright. 4. I shall chant thy high praises forever, O sudden, O subtle, O terrible fire. Thy work is the melting of metals. By thy aid they are fashioned and forged, the ponderous horseshoes, the resounding and bright-bladed scythes that mow and that reap that mow and that reap, many circlets for lily-white fingers, for ring-bounded lives, for ring-fettered years. As with lips growing cold the word love, we repeat, thou createst the tools and machines that shake mountains and shatter and smite, the tools that find deep-buried gold, the keenness of weapons that kill. 5. 
Unto thee, omnipresent and sovereign, my dreaming I vow. I am even as thou. Thou dost light, thou dost burn, thou dost strive. Thou art live, thou art alive. Of old a winged dragon thou wert, to the altar didst glide, thence to ravish the bride, and a fiery guest, a consoler who warmed to the bone the young wife left alone. O brilliant, O burning, O biting, O fierce, in thy flame all the colors arise. Thou art crimson and yellow, thy gleaming doth pierce with the glow of chameleon gold and the scarlet that lights autumn skies. Thou art as a diamond with facets that shine as the feline caress of soft eyes that are heady as wine, as the wave in its ecstasy breaking an emerald line, like the leaf's iridescence agleam with reiterant springs in the dewdrop that trembles and swings, like the green dream of fireflies kindled at night, like the will o' the wisp in the haze like the dark scalloped clouds the grave evening has gilded with light that have spread forth their morning upon the dim face of the smouldering days six i remember o fire how thy flames once enkindled my flesh among writhing witches caught close in thy flame woven mesh how tortured for having beheld what is secret we were flung to the fire for the joy of our sabbath but to those who had seen what we saw yea fire was not ah well i remember the buildings ablaze where we burned in the fires we lit and smiled to behold the flames wind about us the fateful among all the faithless and blind to the chanting of prayers the frenzy of flame we sang thy hosannas o oh, strength-giving fire I have pledged love to thee from the pyre. 7. O fire, I know that thy light with an ultimate splendor our being shall drench. It shall flare up before eyes that death fain would finally quench. With swift knowledge it burns, and with joy heaven high at the vastness of vistas unfolding afar, who has summoned those visions to being, and why? Who has rayed them in colors befitting a star? Beyond life is the answer. O thou heavenward heart of the element ever in flight! On my twilight horizon let death, necromancer, shed perpetual light. End of section 7 Recording by Kevin Davidson, www.blogordie.com Section 8 of Modern Russian Poetry, an Anthology Selected and translated by Babette Deutsch and Avram Yarmolinsky This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Davidson Valery Brusov Born 1873. Brusso's biography coincides with his bibliography. He has filled his life with the labors of a curious minded poet and a sensitive erudite. In 1913, at the age of 40, he began publishing the complete edition of his works in 25 volumes. In addition to poetry, original and translated, it includes two novels, tales, dramas, and critical work. His tales and dramas have a timeless, abstract quality, a curious combination of the Wellesian and the Poesque. His two large novels are marvelous studies in the archaeology of the soul, resorting as they do to the psyche of the Roman decadence and of Germany's dying Middle Ages. Before he came of age he fell under the spell of the French symbolists, and his argosy began by sailing under their colors. His European years sharpened these sympathies. He tried to transplant the French vers libre into Russian soil, and among other things an anthology of French lyrics of the nineteenth century bears witness to his Gallic apprenticeship. Indeed, he achieved a leading place among the Russian symbolists, becoming an editor of their Moscow organ, Viesi, 
the balance. Yet although he adopted all the manners and mannerisms of the neo-romantic reaction, such as aversion to reality, violent eroticism, and extreme individualism, by temperament Brusov is more of a Parnassian. His later work shows a gravitation toward a soberer and more objective conception of art. His craftsmanship is careful and conscious, whether he wanders down the ages, dedicating a line to every god, or traces the pattern of his own moods, or, like his master, Verbaren, finds a rhythm for the voices of the city. According to Gautier's precept, he works dans les brocs résistants, he has an eye for imagery and an ear trained to complex orchestration. The revolution has not exiled Brusov, and he is laboring to preserve the continuity of Russia's culture. In a literary capacity, he holds an important government post. The Trist In the land of Ra the Flaming, by the shores of Nile's slow waters, where the roofs of Thebes were seen, in the days of yore you loved me as dark Isis loved Osiris, sister, friend, and worshipped queen. And the pyramid its shadow on our evening trysts would lean. Oh, the mystery, remember, of our meeting in the temple, in the isle of granite, dim and straight, and the hour when lights extinguished, and the sacred dances broken, each to each was sudden mate our caresses burning whispers ardors that we could not sate in the splendor of the ballroom clinging to me white and tender through time's curtain rift in twain did your ear not catch the anthems mingling with the crash of cymbals and the people's answering refrain did you not repeat in rapture that our love awoke again? Once before we knew existence, this our bliss is a remembrance, and our love a memory. Casting off its ancient ashes, flames again our hungry passion, flames and kindles you and me, as of old by Nile's slow waters in the land beyond the sea. Radiant Ranks of Seraphim Radiant ranks of seraphim stir the air about our bed. With their windy wings and dim, our hot cheeks are comforted. Lo, the circling seraphs bend, and we tremble and rejoice at hosannas that ascend, winged with their unearthly voice. Cloudy, luminous faces hover, and the wing-swept candles wane, and our fiery breasts they cover with hidden holy rain. Benediction. Que tes mains soient bénies, car elles sont impures. Charles Baudelaire. The shining of your golden eyes I bless, that broke my dark delirium with light. The smile that wavers on your lips I bless. It kindled me like wine, it rent my night. The poison in your kisses hid I bless. All thoughts, all dreams are poisoned by your kiss. The sigh that sings in your embrace I bless. All my past years you have mown down with this. The fire of your awful love I bless. I wrapped its flame about me joyfully. The darkness of your spirit, lo, I bless, for that its wings were outstretched over me. Blessed all you gave, blessed what your soul denies, I bless you for the grief, the dread, the pain, that after you I strove toward paradise, that here without its gates I stand in vain. Inevitability. If you kept faith or not, does it avail? If I was faithful or unfaithful to you? Our eyes that would look elsewhere flinch and fail, yet not my will has power to undo you. Once more I tremble, so once more you pale, as the forebodings of old pain break through you, the moments pour with noise of torrents streaming, above us passion's lifted blade is gleaming. Whoever made us lips and lit eyes drinking, of lips and eyes, be it God or fate, is it not one within the circle shrinking? 
we stand to hear the spell reverberate we bend with happiness and fear and sinking we fall two anchors on the sea floor great fancy nor chance nor passion overpowers us whom the ineluctable devours the fierce birds kindling the air fierce birds with feathers of fire through the white portals of paradise flamed like desire virgin vistas reared lit with quivering red and beyond seas where the trackless wanderers fled but on the pillars of marble on the threshold were thrown crimson shadows incredible sunk in the stone and under the arch in eternity's radiance hidden angels exalted in fruits that are secret and sweet and forbidden eventide the posters shout their gorgeous motley blares the signboards groaning fills the street and from the shops a shrill light sharply flares as cries of triumph mock defeat behind the glimmering panes soft fabrics sleep and diamonds pour their poison days above massed coins the lottery numbers leap like northern lights ablaze the burning streets like long canals of light flow on the city is alive it swarms to celebrate the dawn of night like some unloosed and monstrous hive the sky and all its sentient stars are hid by scattered arc lamps beaming blue and harlots jostle sages where they thrid the dancers in a rippling queue between the gay quadrilles that form and break among the waltzers clanking slide the tramways with blue lightnings in their wake like sheaves of fire the motors glide shame like a leader his bright baton wielding to the rank music of the wheels has fused the thousand throated throng that yielding as one a holy chorus peals dust we enthrone thee brief and radiant dust dancing the round we glorify about electric altars where they thrust their spears into the empty sky o cover thy pale feet saint sebastian on slow and smoky fire thou burnst and art consumed o thou my soul on slow and smoky fire thou burnst and art consumed with hidden dole thou droopest like sebastian pierced with pointed arrows harassed and spent thou droopest like sebastian pierced with pointed arrows thy flesh all rent thy foes encircle thee and watch with gleeful laughter and bended bow thy foes encircle thee and watch with gleeful laughter thy torments slow the embers burn and gentle as the arrows stinging neath the evening sky the embers burn and gentle is the arrow stinging when the end draws nigh why hastens not thy dream unto thy lips now pallid with deadly drouth why hastens not thy dream unto thy lips now pallid to kiss thy mouth the coming huns Trample their paradise, Attila, Vyacheslav Ivanov. Where do you stray, heavy Huns, who weigh on the world like a cloud? Far under Asian suns your cast-iron tread is loud. Swoop down in a drunken horde from your dark encampments. Rise in a tide of crimson poured over this land that dies. O slaves of freedom, pitch your tent by the palace gate. Plow deep dig wide the ditch where the throne shone on your hate heap books to build a fire dance in their ruddy light foul altar steps with mire you are children in our sight and we the poets the wise from the onslaught that darkens and raves defending the torch you despise shall it hold in deserts and caves under the scattering storm the tempests that raven and tear what will the hazards of harm from our long labor spare? All that we only knew shall perish and sink and grow dim. 
but you who shall slay me you i salute with hosanna and him end of section eight recording by kevin davidson www.bloggerdie.com Section 9 of Modern Russian Poetry, an Anthology, selected and translated by Babette Deutsch and Avram Yarolinsky. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Davidson. Ivan Bunyan, born 1870. When Bunyan came to Petersburg at the age of 25, he brought with him memories of shabby manorial grandeur of hack work in the provinces, and of a Tolstoyan influence that at one time persuaded him to become a cooper. The young man, meeting the modernists for the first time, dubbed them sick boys with complete chaos in their heads. Bunyan is himself a traditionalist in an age of iconoclasm, a realist in a neo-romantic generation, a sober lyricist solitary among his ecstatic fellows. His minor music has the simplicity and sincerity of a sorrowful Mozart. He celebrates the melancholy charm of vanishing things, never forswearing his classic clarity. Yet there is a growing exotic strain in this poet of the northern Russian landscape. He is a less vivid Le Comte de Lisle, reviving forgotten deities and filling his verse with oriental color fragrance and warmth his nostalgia for the distant seems to grow by the travel upon which it feeds perhaps this intimacy with what is foreign gives his translations from longfellow byron and tennyson their remarkably rich quality when in 1909 bunyan was elected to the academy of sciences this rare distinction was conferred upon him for his prose as much as for his poetry. Indeed, the former is the part of his work which bulks largest. His prose, oeuvre, consists of his black and bitter sketches of the Russian peasantry, naked studies in psychology, and tales in the manner of a diminutive Joseph Conrad. The gentleman from San Francisco one of his most recent and impressive stories is the only one available in English. Bunyan was one of the first to flee Soviet rule, eventually settling in Paris. Russian Spring In the valley the birches are bored, on the meadows fog billows and ways, sodden with horse dung floored, the high road blackens in haze rich on the steppe's sleepy air the odor of freshly baked bread bent to their packs slowly fare two beggars to look for a bed round puddles gleam in the streets the fumes of the ovens stun thawing the bleak earthen seats smolder and steam in the sun by the corn bin dragging his chain the sheep-dog yawns on the sill walled smoke with the charcoal stain the step is foggy and still. The carefree cock will perform day long for the sap stirred earth. In the fields it is drowsy and warm, in the heart indolent mirth. A song. I'm a plain girl whose hands are stained with earth. He is a fisherman, he's gay and keen. The far white sail is drowning in the firth. Many the seas and rivers he has seen. The women of the Bosphorus, they say, are good-looking, and I, I'm lean and black. The white sail drowns far out beyond the bay. It may be that he never will come back. I shall wait on in good and evil weather, if vainly take my wage, go to the sea, and cast the ring and hope away together, and my black braid will serve to strangle me. THE GOD OF NOON Black goats I herded with my sister. They grazed by red rocks. The grass rose stiff and stinging. Warming their backs, stones to the foothills clinging, slept dumbly on, and sheer blue shone the bay. By the gnarled silver of an olive flinging, my drowsy limbs in its dry shade I lay. He came, like a hot cobweb net a sway. 
or like a cloud of flies about me singing he bared my knees kindled my quiet feet the silver on my shirt his white fire burned his hot embrace is heavy ah and sweet he laid me on my back the whole sky turned he tanned my naked bosom to the teat from him the chamomile's kind use i learned in an empty house from the walls the paper's blue is vanished the daguerreotypes the icons banished only there the deepened blue appears where these hid it hanging through the years from the heart the memory has perished perished all that long ago it cherished those remain of whom death hides the face leaving their yet unforgotten trace flax she sits on tumulus savour and stares old woman death upon the crowded road like a blue flame the small flax flower flares thick through the meadow sowed and says old woman death hey traveller does any one want linen linen fit for funeral wear a shroud madame or sir i'll take a cheap coin for it and says serene savour don't crow so loud even the winding sheet is dust and cracks and crumbles into earth that from the shroud may spring the sky-blue flax Vyacheslav Ivanov, born 1866. Ivanov's life was not one to hurry to a sphere and show and end. Rather, his fruit slower grew and later hung. He began to write at the age of 37, after having spent half as many years abroad as a student, and joined the ranks of the symbolists. He learned antiquity from Momsum, Athens, and Rome, and modernity from Nietzsche and Dostoevsky. A curious feature of Ivanov's thinking is a synthesis of Dionysus and Christ, which is characteristic of the Greek revival in Russia, and which is attested to his profound treatise on the Hellenic religion of the suffering God. His exquisite art feeds on the Dionysian grape, but this has a sacramental flavor, and strangely through the features of his dionysus shows the effigy of a tragic christ to him religion is the very stuff of culture and art a myth-making and even a thergic power and like his older fellow symbolists he builds not upon individualism but upon the principle of sobornost or communal religious expression suggestive of vacho lindsay's creed he has the mentality and the manner of a mystagogue and a pontiff. Ivanov's poetry is caviar to the general. His pegasus is caparisoned with abstruse erudition and weighed down with intricate thought. Yet a limpid golden beauty triumphs over the shadows in many lyrics. These are cast in the pure Grecian mold these burns with a's spiritual flame and these are the ordered ecstasies of a francis thompson his latest poems are a cycle of winter sonnets written in blockaded petrograd in 1920 filled with the sadness of resignation to loss and change the catch now the golden leafage is beggared shining through the porches of autumn shows the cool blue stillness of heaven lo the thin-trunked grove is transcended carved in stone a columned cathedral smoke scrolls wind about the frail friezes flung above the doors is a curtain open work like nets of god's fishers that the catch has slipped through and broken like thy tatters sacred and lovely at the entrance of a white temple o thou golden mendicant music autumn the air is sad and still a bright transparency in skied a woman veiled in light invisibly upholds a balance high above the clear sun's pouring the instant's equipoise 
serene and frail, adoring. But each sear leaf that from the trees falls separate, and lays upon the golden scales its trembling weight, may force the balance, summer's plenty freighted, down to the wintry regions, soon to darkness fated. Fountain Clear the fountain waters glowing, living streams, the well-springs flowing, cold and darkling woods, a spring, in the shed, cool stillness streaming, o'er the well, a candle gleaming, on Christ's crown its gilding flings. In the Eden field, a bower, and a fountain, and a flower, Christ, star-voiced, the spirit stills, come before the well-spring stooping of my quiet waters scooping for the stintless bucket fills the seeking of self dying the seed will discover the self it finds in the losing that is o nature thy law that is thy lesson o man hearing dark music the poet knoweth no rest he abideth purer and purer the sound, clearer the foreuttered word. Complaint Your soul, born deaf and blind, inhabits jungles of sunless reverie, where with the crash of trampled saplings wild droves of dark desires roam free. A torch I kindled in the darkness to lead you to my starry gate, with seeds of light and shining handfuls, the furs of your night to sate. I stand amid the trackless stretches and hail you in the wilderness, but lost in dark and dreary caverns my cry sinks silent, answerless. Narcissus, a Pompeian bronze. Beautiful boy, like a fawn here in loneliness roaming, who art thou? Surely no child of the woods, thine is too prideful a face. Music that moves at thy gait, the wrought grace of thy sumptuous sandal, tell thou art son to the gods, or the high offspring of kings. Poised with thy listening limbs, thou hast followed the lips of the forest, hearkening, bending thy head, fingering softly the sound. Was it the piping of Pan, or the amorous sighing of Echo? Whisper of dryads, or words, fluent-limbed naiads repeat. Pressing thy thigh with thy arm, now the light shoulder-fleece like a garland, thou hast entwined on thy wrist, thou, like Laius at rest. Wonderful! Art thou in truth the gay Bacchus, Nicaean nymphs cherished? Hunter, whom goddess loved, naked and idle and young? Or art thou haughty Narcissus, whom sweet secret harmonies guided, wandering languid with sleep, drunken, alone with his dream? Go seek the summoning nymph, O thou blind, not yet knowing thy image. Go thou, but dare not to bend over the slumbering wave. O if thou art not Narcissus, yet seeing thy face in the waters, stranger, I tremble anew, thou a Narcissus shalt be. Funeral. Of funerals the saddest is love's that dies unanswered. The soul has two to bury, the soul of the beloved and its own other selfhood, and a third enters living, the funeral flame that wraps them, his wings a yoke has waited, him the wise lips of lovers call in their kisses Eros and God's the Resurrector. The Holy Rose The Holy Rose her leaves will soon unfold, the tender bud of dawn already lies, reddening on the wide transparent skies. Love's star is a white sail the still seas hold. Here, in the light-soaked space above the wold, through the descending dew the arches rise, of the unseen cathedral filled with cries from the winged weavers threading it with gold here on the hill the cypress in accord with me stands praying a cowled eremite and on the roses cheeks the tears fall light upon my cell the pattern rays are poured and in the east the purple vines bleed bright and seething overflow hosanna lord 
Nomads of Beauty. You are artists, nomads of beauty. Flamings. For you, ancestral acres, and choked the graveyard waits. For us, the free forsakers, the camp that beauty fates. For us, the daily treason, the tents we daily flee, mocked by each dawning season of our captivity. Believe the dimmer distance, all curtains, magic veils, all springtides, green persistence, whole heavens, vasty gales. O vagrant artists, shepherd your droves of dreams unbound, and so, although you jeopard the soon abandoned ground, and from your open spaces rush down a whirling horde, where slaves tame to the traces adore their overlord. Trample their Eden, plough them, O Attila, with scars, and grow to beauty, vow them, your step flowers like stars. End of section nine. Recording by Kevin Davidson. www.blogordie.com Section 10 of Modern Russian Poetry, an Anthology. Selected and translated by Babette Deutsch and Avram Yarmolinsky. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Davidson. Jurgis Baltrusaitis. Born 1873. Born into a peasant family of Lithuanian Catholics, this member of the symbolist's younger generation began by herding cows in his native village. He tutored his way through high school and reached the University of Moscow, where he soon veered from science to letters. He became both a linguist and a traveler, going west as far as Chicago. Although Baltrushaitis may be claimed by the Lithuanian as well as the Russian literature, this reticent poet does not often avail himself of either tongue. He carries on the philosophical tradition of Russian poetry. His disciplined and concentrated art moves on a plane of abstractions. His is a mystical austerity and a Buddhistic aloofness from things personal. THE PENDULUM When the dumb darkness most heavily clings, Rhythmic and ruthless my pendulum swings, Rustily creaking, or whining dismay, Urging each tarrying moment away. Longing, it seems, for the days that are fled, Down ancient stairways resounds someone's tread, Heavy the footfall on flagstones unlit, Lower and lower, and down to the pit. Praying, it seems, for a long vanished shore, Dumbly the helmsman with slow stubborn oar Brokenly rows me, morosely alone, Into my harbor, afar and unknown. Evil the ferryman, darkly he pounds, Farther and farther, more muffled, resounds, Hostile and hopeless, the long downward climb, Cold, ineluctable footsteps of time. THE SURF The day's wild ocean sings and thunders And beats against the fatal shore. This breaker with dumb sorrows sunders, And these like laughing victors roar. Their sheen the joy of vernal wonders, their sheen, vast winter's shining hoar, in wrath triumphant forward swinging, the lifted billow calls and fails, a joyous giant shouting and singing, its voice the voice of sounding gales, its glory in the sunlight flinging, whose noonday glow it holds and hails. Across the sea, now lightly foaming, another rears that stirs the deep, and floods the shore with silence gloaming, morose and slow it seems to creep like one who drops, worn out with roaming, from his bent back a fatal heap. Each moment anew with changing power, the surface thundering, alone, now idle, now it seems to lower, hymning a silence all unknown, like a dark heart asleep for hour on hour in restless monotone. Maximilian Voloshin, 
Born 1877. Of the three confessed elements of Voloshin's life, places, books, and men, places came first. Born in Kiev, his early impressions were associated with the Crimea and the Hellenic promontory of the Scythian plain. At twenty-three he glimpsed the desert of Central Asia, but in his own words he found the fatherland of his spirit on the Mediterranean littoral and Paris was the peak on which the climbing poet came to rest, finding there the lifting consciousness of rhythm and form. Books came second, Russian, of course, and later foreign books, the sophistry of France and the wisdom of immemorial India. Men, Voloshin admits, came last, and so his acid bites into the plate most frequently to etch still life, or a landscape where the presence of God or man is a thing remembered. By his own acknowledgment, he learnt the art of verse from Ivanov, Balmont, and Heredia. Whatever he may have derived from the Russian poets, it is clear that he shares Heredia's precision and plastic perfection, his sonority and color. Voloshin's is a richly visual poetry, Indeed, he has earned his bread as a painter. Like Heredia, he is a sonneteer of consummate skill. The sonnet from Lenaria, given here, concludes a cycle of fifteen, which are so written that the last line of each forms the first line of the next, the final sonnet being composed of the first lines of the preceding fourteen. And finally, it may be said of him, as it was of Heredia, that this Parnassian is a modernist, Yet he has ever stood aloof from coteries, an aristocratic and solitary figure. Although seemingly de Pese and above the battle, Voloshin has quite recently written several poems of exasperated and retrograde patriotism, which, irrespective of their politics, are magnificent poetry. Sumerian Twilight One the evening light has soaked with ancient gold and gall the yellow hills like tawny fur grass rises shaggy in a ruddy blur past fiery bushes metal waves unfold and enigmatic cliffs and boulders hold worn troughs that are the sea's chronologer in the winged twilight figures seem to stir a heavy paw a jowl grins stark and bold like swelling ribs the dubious hillocks show on what bent back like wool does savory grow what brute what titan to this region cleaves the dark is strange and yonder space is clean and there the tired ocean panting heaves and rotting grasses breathe of iodine sumerian twilight two here stood a sacred forest. Here the messenger, winged-footed, went his touch upon the dumb glades leaving. Upon the sight of cities, nor stones nor ruins heaving. Now on burnt slopes but sheep in scattered patches stir. The mountain peaks cut crowns across each bitten spur. The clear green twilight flows, mysteriously grieving by whose dim longing stung what is my soul retrieving who knows the road of gods the dawns and dusks that blur in its sonorous caves the rubble churned is sounding lifting its weighty crests the troubled sea is pounding upon the sandy dunes upon the ringing shore the heavy nights pass on in tears through starry spaces the outcast gods command whom men invoke no more and ineluctably they show dark alien faces sumerian twilight three above dark rippled waters rises in retreat earth's heavy mass the spines and rocky crests defying the tortured steep in torrents of red rubble lying a lifeless land its morning reaches at my feet sad dreams and solemn dreams flow by me bitter sweet 
earth ancient and obscure whose echoing bays are sighing where in late twilight with a sadder beauty dying the waves and waste hexameters billow and beat and where no roadways run upon the dark still rivers breathing an ancient mystery the dim sail swells and quivers with winds of tossed desire and seas that lift and fall an alien tremor takes my ship upon its going where destined roads of daring and retribution call and lamp-like in the sky the seven stars are glowing sonnet fifteen from the sonnet cycle lunaria pure pearl of silence brooding on the sky presider or conception lamp of dreams altar of nightly spells of crystal gleams queen of the waters where thou lovest to lie with what desire where the long waves sigh through my dark crucifixions toward thy beams toward dion toward fierce hecate fair streams the vision yet unlived that shall not die how strange thy diamond delirium shines in thy fair hollows in thy joyless lines and in the flashing mica of thy seas in listless ether thou art horror's face thou longings cry whom icy gaolers freeze thou dead world's avid corpse cast out on space stigmata who's the flying hands about me shedding fire and leading me on passionate ways no sonorous stones my feet are treading but where vatic waters fill the days piercing through the spirit sharp pilasters rise and candles sting the dark like bees oh the hearts that blossom like crimson asters petalled with gold-bladed ecstasies now the evening on the temple flinging patterned carven crimson shines and mourns oh the pale brow to the altar clinging stung anew with stinging scarlet thorns the whole soul high vaults and portals glowing fear like incense swaths with dim blue bands ah, i know you sacred corals glowing on the pierced palms of those outstretched hands mikhail kuzmin born eighteen seventy seven this sensitive and precious decadent who flaunts his descent from french emigres and russian noblemen delights in literary masquerading he is in turn an eighteenth-century dandy a byzantine romancer contemporary of boccaccio or a fin de siècle alexandrian his alexandrian songs imprison all the exquisite fatigues and refined perversions of a culture cynical about its own passing the texture of his poetry shows the care and competence lavished by a bell upon her complexion his lyrics have the perfumed fragility and piquant charm of Somov's paintings. Now dry thy eyes, now dry thy eyes, and shed no tears in heaven's straw-paled meadows veers Aquarius and earthward peers, his emptied vessel overturning, no storming snows, no clouds that creep across the sheer pure emerald steep, whence thinly drawn a ray darts deep as a keen lance with edges burning night was done night was done we rose and after washing dressing kissed with laughter after all the sweet night knows lilac breakfast cups were clinking while we sat like brothers drinking tea and kept our dominoes and our dominoes smiled greeting and our eyes avoided meeting with our dumb lips secrecy faust we sang we played denying night's strange memories strangely dying as though night's twain were not we from alexandrian songs dying is sweet on the battlefield 
in the hissing of arrows and spears, when the trumpet sounds, and the sun of noon is shining, dying for country's glory, and hearing around you, Hero, farewell! Dying is sweet, for an old venerable man, in the house on the bed, where your forebears were born, where they died, surrounded by children, grown men, and hearing around you, Father, farewell! But sweeter, wiser, having spent the last penny, having sold the last mill for a woman who the next day is forgotten, having come from a gay promenade to the sole dismantled mansion to sup, and to read the tale of Apuleius, the hundred and first reading in the warm, fragrant bath, hearing no farewell to open your veins and through the long skylight must come the scent of stock gillyflower, dawn must be glowing, and flutes be heard from afar. End of section 10 Recording by Kevin Davidson www.blogordie.com Section 11 of Modern Russian Poetry, an Anthology Selected and translated by Babette Deutsch and Avram Yabelinsky. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Davidson. Georgi Chulkov, born 1879. Chulkov has versified in the strained mode current ten years ago and has written novels that are diluted Dostoevsky. He shared the latter's Siberian experiences in fact being exiled for participation in student disturbances. He early began to theorize about the necessity for a return to a more sober and realistic art enriched by the modernistic adventures. PURPLE AUTUMN Purple Autumn unloosened her tresses and flung them on the heavens and over the dew-heavy fields. She came as a guest to the old silent house singeing the grasses with red. Through the garden she moved, up the balcony, scarcely she touched the fragile old rails. She pushed the door panel softly, softly she entered the room, sprinkling the rugs with her sun-yellow dust, dropped a red leaf upon the piano. Ever after that hour we heard her unceasing, her tireless rustling rustle and stir and soft whisper, and our hands suddenly met with no new words, new and forever false, as though we had hung a wreath of red roses on a black wrought iron door leading into a vault where lay the rotting body of a beloved dream. Autumnal days were upon us, days of inscrutable longing, we were treading the stairs of autumnal passion, in my heart a wound, like the lamp of an icon, burned and would not be quenched. The cup of autumnal poison we pressed to our lips, by the serpentine garden path autumn had led us to crepuscular lilies upon the pale sand humbled pond and over the lilied waters and in the roses of evening we loved more superstitiously, and through the dark night on the languorous bed at the feet of my love I loved death anew. The minutes rang, tinkling like crystals, at the brink of an autumn grave. Autumn and death drunkenly clinked their glasses. I pressed my thirsty lips to the feet the icon lamp burnished. I drank the cup of love, burned by the fires of sins, stretched on the cross of lusts, shamed, being needlessly faithless. I drank the cup of love in the hour of ineffable dalliance. I sensed the whisper of autumn pain, of autumn passion, and kisses like keen needles burned and pierced weaving a wreath of thorns. Alexander Bloch, 1880-1921 to 
Alexander Bloch was educated at the University of St. Petersburg, of which his grandfather was the rector. He belongs to the second generation of symbolists, and his first volume, which appeared in 1905, savors strongly of Solovyov's spirituality. The upheaval which was shaking his country is ignored in this book. Instinct with vague eschatological expectations and devoted to the eternal feminine, yet here she wears the medieval aspect of the lady beautiful and spirit in her is married to flesh these songs employing an easy symbolic cryptogram mingle the prayers of the postulant with a rarefied sensuousness this asserts itself in the succeeding volumes the white melody is muffled by the voices of earth Bloch flees monastic walls for the confusion of the thoroughfares. The skirts of the lady beautiful are defiled, and the poet is stretched upon the cross of passion, with the bitter conviction that he is fated to love her in heaven only to betray her on earth. Christ and Russia are the other hypostases of Bloch's trinity. Their Golgotha strangely at one with his own. Whether he is a maker of masks for monastic harlequins, or another Oedipus before the Russian Sphinx, whether he writes children's verse, lyrical dramas of an elusive symbolism, or poems reminiscent of the earlier Yeats, he reveals a keen emotional intensity and an unfailing sensitiveness of technique. It was given to this delicate and remote lyricist to produce the most significant poem of the proletarian revolution. This is his striking epic called The Twelve, which is known far beyond the confines of Russia and is accessible in half a dozen languages. Into Crimson Dark Into crimson dark thou goest, thy vast orbits mock the eye small the echo that thou throwest far i hear thy footfalls die art thou near too far for greeting lost in topless altitudes shall i wait a sudden meeting where sonorous stillness broods in the solitude resounding distant footsteps echo free is it thou who flamest bounding circles of infinity the Unknown Woman I have foreknown thee, I have foreknown thee. Going, the years have shown me thy premonitory face. Intolerably clear, the farthest sky is glowing. I wait in silence, thy withheld and worshipped grace. The farthest sky is glowing, white for thy appearing. Yet terror clings to me. Thy image will be strange. And insolent suspicion will rouse upon thy nearing. The features long foreknown, beheld at last, will change. How shall I then be fallen? Lo, with no defender. Dead dreams will conquer me. The glory glimpsed will change. The farthest sky is glowing. Nearer looms the splendor yet terror clings to me thy image will be strange the lady unknown of evenings hangs above the restaurant a humid wild and heavy air the springtide spirit brooding pestilent commands the drunken outcries there far off above the alley's mustiness where bored gray summer-houses lie the baker's sign swings gold through dustiness, and loud and shrill the children cry. Beyond the city stroll the exquisites at every dusk and all the same, their derbies tilted back, the pretty wits are playing at the ancient game. Upon the lake but feebly furious, soft screams and creaking oarlocks sound, and in the sky, blasé, incurious, the moon beholds the earthly round, and every evening, dazed and serious, I watch the same procession pass, in liquor, raw and yet mysterious, one friend is mirrored in my glass. 
Beside the scattered tables, somnolent and dreary waiters stick around. In vino veritas, shout violent and red-eyed fools in liquor drowned. And every evening, strange, immutable, is it a dream no waking proves, as to a rendezvous inscrutable, a silken lady darkly moves. She slowly passes by the drunken ones, and lonely by the window sits, and from her robes above the sunken ones a misty fainting perfume flits. Her silks resilience, and the tapering of her ringed fingers and her plumes stir vaguely like dim incense vaporing, deep ancient fates their mystery illumes. I try, held in this strange captivity, to pierce the veil that darkling falls. I see enchanted shores declivity, and an enchanted distance calls. I guard dark secrets tortuosities. A sun is given me to hold, and acrid wine finds out the sinuosities that in my soul were locked of old and in my brain the soft slow flittering of ostrich feathers waves once more and fathomless the azure glittering where two eyes blossom on the shore my soul holds fast its treasure renitent the key is safe and solely mine ah you are right drunken impenitent i also know truth lies in wine a little black man a little black man ran through the city he extinguished the lanterns climbing the stairs slow and white dawn was approaching with the strange little man climbing the stairs where quiet soft shadows brooded over the town where the yellow strips of the lanterns were sleeping morning twilight upon the steps lay down and to the curtains into the door shadows creeping Oh, how poor is the city, with dawn at her windows lying, crouched outside, the little black man is crying. Russia To sin unshamed, to lose unthinking, the count of careless nights and days, and then while the head aches with drinking, steal to God's house with eyes that glaze. Thrice to bow down to earth, and seven times cross oneself beside the door, with the hot brow in hope of heaven touching the spittle-covered floor, with a brass farthing's gift dismissing the offering, the holy name to mutter with loose lips in kissing the ancient kiss-worn icon frame, and coming home then to be tricking some wretch out of the same small coin, and with an angry hiccup kicking a lean cur in his trembling groin, and where the icon's flame is quaking, drink tea and reckon loss and gain from the fat chest of drawers taking the coupons wet with spittle stain, and sunk in feather beds to smother in slumber such as bears may know, dearer to me than every other are you, my Russia even so. When Mountain Ash When mountain ash in clusters reddens, its leafage wet and stained with rust, when through my palm the nail that deadens by bony hands is shrewdly thrust, when leaden rippling rivers freeze me, as on the wet gray height I toss, while my austere-faced country sees me, for I am swinging on the cross. Then, through my bloody agonizing, my staring eyes with tears grown stiff shall see on the broad river rising Christ moving toward me in a skiff, and in his eyes the same hopes bidding and the same rags from him will trail, his garment piteously hiding the palm pierced with the final nail. Christ, saddened are the native reaches the cross tugs at my failing might, thy skiff, will it achieve these beaches, and land here at my cruciate height? The Scythians Pan-Mongolism, though the word is strange, my ear acclaims its gongs, 
Vladimir Solovyov. You are the millions, we are multitude, and multitude and multitude, come fight. Yea, we are Scythians, yea, Asians, a squint-eyed, greedy brood. For you the centuries, for us one hour, like slaves obeying and aboard, we were the shield between the breeds of Europe and the raging Mongol horde. For centuries your ancient hammers forged and drowned the thunder of far hates, you heard like wild fantastic tales old lisbon's and messina's sudden fates yea so to love as our hot blood can love long since you ceased to love the taste you have forgotten of a love that burns like fire and like the fire lays waste all things we love clear numbers burning chill the ecstasies that secret bloom all things we know the gallic light and the parturient germanic gloom and we remember all parisian hells the breath of venice's lagoons far fragrance of green lemon groves and dim colognes cathedral splintered moons and flesh we love its color and its taste its deathy odor heavy raw and is it our guilt if your bones may crack beneath our powerful supple paw it is our wont to seize wild colts at play they rear and impotently shake wild manes we crush their mighty croups and shrewish women slaves we tame or break come unto us from the black ways of war come to our peaceful arms and rest comrades while it is not too late sheathe the old sword may brotherhood be blessed if not we have not anything to lose we also know old perfidies by sick descendants you will be accursed for centuries and centuries to welcome pretty europe we shall spread and scatter in the tangled space of our wide thickets we shall turn to you our alien asiatic face for centuries your eyes were turned toward the east our pearls you hoarded in your chests, and mockingly you bowed the day when you could aim your cannon at our breasts. The time has come. Disaster beats its wings. With every day the insults grow. The hour will strike, and without ruth your proud and powerless pestums be laid low. O oh, pause, old world, while life still beats in you. O oh, weary one, O oh, worn, O oh, wise! Halt there, as once did Oedipus, before the Sphinx's enigmatic eyes. Yea, Russia is a Sphinx, exalting, grieving, and sweating blood she cannot sate, her eyes that gaze and gaze and gaze at you with stone-lipped love for you and hate. Go, all of you, to Ural fastness. We clear the battleground for war, cold number shaping guns of steel where the fierce mongol hordes in frenzy pour but we we shall no longer be your shield but careless of the battle cries shall watch the deadly duel seethe aloof with injurate and narrow eyes we shall not move when the ferocious hun despoils the corpse and leaves it bare burns towns herds cattle in the church and smell of white flesh roasting fills the air for the last time old world we bid you come feast brotherly within our walls to share our peace and glowing toil once only the barbarian lyre calls from the twelve the city's roar is far away black silence broods on neva's brink no more police we can be gay, comrades, without a drop to drink. A bourgeois, a lonely mourner, his nose tucked in his ragged fur, stands lost and idle on the corner, tagged by a cringing mangy cur. The bourgeois, like a hungry mongrel, a silent question stands and begs. The old world, like a kinless mongrel, stands there, its tail between its legs. End of section 11. Recording by Kevin Davidson. www.blogordie.com
Section 12 of Modern Russian Poetry, an Anthology. Selected and translated by Babette Deutsch and Avram Yarmolinsky. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Davidson. Andrei Bieli, pseudonym of Boris Bugayev, born 1880. Reared in a professional atmosphere in which science was the major element, Boris Bugayev, better known under his pseudonym of Andrei Bieli, has lived a double life as artist and analyst. The artist was engrossed in problems of form. He created an interesting experimental genre, which he called symphony, with cadenced prose, verbal instrumentation, and musical development of themes. The analyst, on his part, used mathematical formulae on the poet's fine frenzy, inaugurating a science of rhythmics, at least for the Russians. Yet Bieli is no aesthete, but a mystic, who gropes towards the light of Christ, the timeless taper, and who lives by the uncertain hope of the ineffable coming. The metaphysical conflict is constantly invading the field of his poetic endeavor until his lyrics become the battle cries of his spiritual tourneys. He is responsible for more theorizing about symbolism than anyone else, but characteristically enough, he erects this nebula into a Weltanschauung and almost into an ethics. His poetry is rarefied and difficult. Its delicate imagery is but an overtone of a resonant spiritual note. His poems have an esoteric quality, which is also evidenced in his two famous novels, The Silver Dove and Petersburg. Through both moves a curious counterpoint of the apocalyptic and the homely, muffled by theosophic speculation. The proletarian revolution elicited from Bieli a cycle of poems suggestively entitled Christ is Risen. Herein he envisions Russia, of which he once despaired, as the new Nazareth. Quite recently he completed the first part of a monumental epic planned for ten volumes. Messengers In fields hopeless and dumb droops the pale-bladed grain. It is dozing and numb amid dreams that are vain. With a high, sudden hum, the field tosses its mane. Unto us Christ is come. The wild news shakes the plain like a wind-beaten drum, shouts the quivering grain. The bells ring soft and slow. There is clamor and pain in the church, and a low voice is lifted again that reiterates woe to the poor folk and plain are brought candles aglow christ is coming again but with voices of woe they file doorward in pain euthanasia the shining and ponderous goblet i empty the earth drops below me all things sink away i am treading cold space the vast void the dim ether but distant in ancient space looming my glimmering goblet the sun i look far below me are lying the rivers the forests the valleys estranged in the vanishing distance a cloud blowing fog on my eyelids trails gossamer gold in its going the flickering landscape is burning its last midday stars newly kindled look into my soul sparkling welcome with radiance silently streaming the end of long wanderings brother lies here in your motherland welcome slow hour upon hour in procession slow centuries smiling pass onward in ancient space proudly i lift it my glimmering goblet the sun you sit on the bed there opening poem of the funeral mass cycle you sit on the bed there in the sun sets full crimson pillows crumpled looking distracted what troubles you 
O oh, swept by transparent gold cataracts, the fir tree tops loom athwart the sky's blue. Orphaned alone I shall languish through summery twilights and winter nights that are new flights, but try them I dare not. Oh, do not die. Oh, above the pines I float off into ether seas. Who there, what there, swathes the sky with whitenesses as with vestments of silver? Victor Hoffman, 1882 to 1911. Hoffman has to his credit some short stories and two books of lyrics, the second of which appeared two years before his suicide in Paris. Still was the evening. Still was the evening of the ball, the summer ball, with dancers wending where ancient linden shadows fall upon the river steeply bending. Where in the trees the breezes breathe, and willows droop like drowsy dreamers, where it seemed beautiful to wreathe the lanterns and the colored streamers. A languorous waltz of slow retreatings, a waltz that singing hardly sounded, and many faces, many meetings, soft clouds like women's shoulders rounded. The river looked like a sculptured stream, serenely the whole heaven holding, a fluent and enchanted dream of joyous miracles unfolding. A crimson mantle, golden bright, upon the clouds the sun was flinging. The dream-swept waltz was drowned in light, and calling through the dusk and singing. A languorous waltz beside the river, and many meetings, many faces. And near cheek's warmth and lovely quiver, where eyelash with curved eyelash laces. Vasily Bashkin, circa 1880 to 1909. In his prose, Bashkin chronicled the career of Russia's radical intellectuals, and as a poet he acted the part of a tame Tertius in the camp of the revolution. He was cut off by tuberculosis early in life. Upon the Black Brow of a Cliff Upon the black brow of a cliff where no life ever stirred, a lighted, strong, hoary-winged eagles, grave bird upon bird. They whetted their claws on the stones, sitting massive and grum, and loudly they called on their lately fledged comrades to come, slow measured and heavy the beat of their wings on the skies, assuageless the rage that tempestuous burned in their eyes, and each newly come they acclaimed with the pride of the peer, Hail, comrade, delay not, the days we have longed for are near. Sergei Gorodetsky This rather uneven and sometimes slovenly poet worshipped at many shrines. He was a lyric myth-maker with Ivanov, a symbolist with Bloch, an advocate of several fashionable doctrines, including mystical anarchy, and mystical realism. At the head of the Guild of Poets, which was formed shortly before the war, Gorodetsky attacked symbolism with Johnsonian zeal in the name of the acmeist faith in realities. The poet became a jingo patriot when Russia entered the war, and later was as vociferously allied to the Bolsheviks as he had been to his Tsar. His best work is informed with spirited spontaneity, the poetic restoration of the obscure Russian paganism, and a few lyrics carrying the dancing lilt of the folk-song form his chief contribution. Yarilla. First to sharpen the axe flint they bent, on the green they had gathered unpent, they had gathered beneath the green tent, there where whitens a pale tree-trunk naked there where whitens a pale linden trunk by the linden tree by the young linden by the linden tree by the young linden the linden trunk white and naked at the fore shaggy lean hoar of head moves the wizard as old as his runes he has lived over two thousand moons and the axe he inhumed from the far lakes he loomed 
long ago it is his at the trunk the first blow and two priestesses in their tenth spring to the old one they bring in their eyes terror lies like the trunk their young bodies are bright their wan white has she only the tender young linden one he took one he led to the trunk roughly wed a white bride and the axe rose and hissed and a voice was upraised and then died thus the first blow was dealt to the trunk others followed him others appraised that age-old bloody axe that keen flint-bladed axe the flesh once the tree twice fiercely cleaving and the trunk reddened fast and it took on a face lo this notch is a nose this an eye for the nonce the flesh once the trunk twice till all reddened the rise and the grass crimsoned deep on the sod in the red stains there lies a new god the birch tree upon an amber day i loved you first when summoned by the radiant azure from every grateful twig there burst sweet indolence in dripping measure your whitely shining body gleamed as white as heady foam on lakes unfolding gay laughing lil drew out the bright black hair its beauty lightly holding himself the god yarilla crowned your hair with garlands green in gorgeous pleasure and flung it plaited to the air green glory tossed upon the azure anna akhmatova anna akhmatova was at one time identified with the acmeist group which represented a reaction against symbolism the work of this talented lyricist is notable for its classic tendency and the insistence on purely personal themes her tenuous verse delights in a sophisticated simplicity the first of her four slender volumes appeared in nineteen twelve like a white stone like a white stone deep in a draw well lying as hard and clear a memory lies in me i cannot strive nor have i heart for striving it is such pain and yet such ecstasy it seems to me that some one looking closely into my eyes would see it patent pale and seeing would grow sadder and more thoughtful than one who listens to a bitter tale the ancient gods change men to things but left them a consciousness that smouldered endlessly that splendid sorrows might endure forever and you are changed into a memory confession from my poor sins i am set free in lilac dusk the taper smoulders the dark stoles rigid drapery conceals a massive head and shoulders talitha kumi it is he once more how fast the heart is beating a touch a hand moves absently the customary cross repeating broad gold the evening broad gold the evening colors grow the april air is cool and tender you should have come ten years ago and yet in welcome i surrender come here sit closer in our nook and turn gray eyes at what my nurses might never glimpse the blue bound book that holds my awkward childish verses forgive me that i did not look sunward with joy but dwelt with sorrow Forgive me all whom I mistook, for you, oblivious of the morrow. Prayer Give me comfortless seasons of sickness, visitations of wrath and of wrong. On my house, Lord, take child and companion, and destroy the sweet power of song. Thus I pray, at each matins, each vespers, after these many wearying days that the storm-cloud which broods over russia may be changed to a nimbus ablaze end of section twelve recording by kevin davidson 
www.blogordie.com Section 13 of Modern Russian Poetry, an Anthology Selected and Translated by Babette Deutsch and Avram Yavrilinsky This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Davidson Igor Severyanin, pseudonym of Igor Lotovyrov. The story goes that at the beginning of his poetic career, Severyanin took his constitutional on the Nevsky Prospekt, wearing a yellow shirtwaist with green roses painted on his cheeks. He enjoys the distinction of having founded the ego futuristic group in Petrograd, which opposed the cubo futurist group in Moscow. He later betrayed the coterie, but remained faithful to its canons of sound against sense. His insistence on neologisms and words created ex nihilo has produced a style which is becoming a poetic idiom. Yet a genuine musical quality saves some of his intolerably clownish and vacuous verse. His first book, The Thunder Seething Cup, was published in 1913, and ran into seven editions in two years, and he has now some ten volumes to his credit. His poetry recitals have diverted both Tsarist and Bolshevist Russia. And it passed by the seashore. Poesa Mignonette. And it passed by the seashore, where the foam laces flower, where the city barouches only rarely are seen. There the queen played her Chopin in the high palace tower, and there, listening to Chopin, the young page loved the queen, and what passed there was simple, and what passed there was charming. The fair page cut the pomegranate as red as her dreams, then the queen gave him half thereof, with graces disarming. She outwearied and loved him in sonata-sweet themes. Then she gave herself stormily, till night shut her lashes, till the sun set the queen lay, there she slept as a slave. And it passed by the seashore where the turquoise wave washes, where sonatas are singing, and where foam frets the wave. A Russian Song Lace and roses in the forest morning shine, Shrewdly the small spider climbs his cobweb line. Dews are diamonding and blooming fairy bright. What a golden air, what beauty, oh, what light! It is good to wander through the dawn-shot rye, Good to see a bird, a toad, a dragonfly. Hear the sleepy crowing of the noisy cock, And to laugh at echo, and to hear her mock. Ah, I love in vain my morning voice to hurl, Ah, off in the birches, but to glimpse a girl. Glimpse, and leaning on the tangled fence To chase dawn's unwilling shadows from her morning face. Ah, to wake her from her half-surrendered sleep. Tell her of my new-sprung dreams that lift and leap. Hug her trembling breasts that press against my heart. Stir the morning in her, hear its pulses start. Spring Apple Tree Aquarelle An apple tree in spring shakes me to see it grow, its branches whitely weighted with unmelting snow. So might a hunched-backed girl stand, beautiful and dumb, as trembling the tree stands and strikes my genius numb. It looks into the wide pale shadows, mirror clear, seeking to shed the dews that stain it like a tear, and stilled with horror, groans like a rude rusty cart, seeing the dismal hunch mocked by the pool's bright art, when steely sleep alights upon the silent lake for the bent apple tree, as for a sick girl's sake I come to offer tenderness the boughs would miss. I press upon the petal-perfumed tree a kiss. Then trustingly, with tears, the tree confides her care to me, and brushes with a touch my back-blown hair. 
her boughs encircle me her little twigs in lace and i lift up my lips to kiss her flowering face nikolai kluyev this sophisticated folk poet a peasant by birth began to write just before the outbreak of the war when he brought out three volumes of verse within two years his mastery of his medium has developed steadily his imagery vivid and concrete derives from two sources the routine of rural life and christian symbolism kaluyev hailed the social revolution and russia as its messiah his most recent work the izba songs has a quality of deep and original homeliness a northern poem sunset dreams on fir tree cones green the hedge and brown the field mossy rifts in weathered stones meekly vernal waters yield oh look up the wooded steep god has touched it with his palm piously wild berries weep listening to the grassy psalm and i feel no fleshy tie and my heart's a springing mead come ye pilgrims white and shy peck the early wheaten seed tender evening twilight searches cottage windows gabled byres and the leaves of slender birches glimmer soft as wedding fires and isba song the stove is orphaned now the old housewife has died the trivet tells the pot with tears their talk is harried Behind the pane two trustful magpies side by side chirp. May is near. Today the finches will be married. Smith Woodpecker, with busy knocking, has stripped his throat. The mole, the sullen miner, creeps sunward, meekly leaving his tunnel. Dark estate to bugs without a groat. The cranes are homing now. The sparrow, pert and thieving, has heard the jackdaw blurt the secret of her egg. The tangled mop awaits the bucket, limp and tired. She thinks the unwashed porch for spuming suds must beg. How gay would be the splash of water, how desired! A window full of sun-ray, tow, an endless fairy tale. Behind the stove the house sprite gabbles, quick and clever, of the new tenant's stillness within the churchyard's pale of crosses listening to things nameless forever of how the dark church entrance lulls the linger dream the house sprite gabbles on above the bleak hour's darkness the peasant hut is scowling pewter eye a gleam the lonely window stares out at the thaw and darkness lubov stolitsa this young woman exhibits a charm which is insistently and delightfully feminine a lenten one noon in golden thaw is garbed with glory midnight's wrap of silver snows is hoary pink the buds among the aspen ashes where the diamond hoarfrost softly flashes my kind cat has furtively departed but the swallow has returned high-hearted winter grief no more our dumb lips locking but upon the heart spring grief is knocking and at noon we weep our bosoms crossing midnight sees us in hot slumber tossing quiet lips knees pressed as though in prayer but our shadowed eyes are our betrayer end of section thirteen Recording by Kevin Davidson, www.blogordie.com Section 14 of Modern Russian Poetry, an Anthology Selected and translated by Babette Deutsch and Avram Yarmolinsky This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Davidson Sergei Yesenin. One of the latest comers, Yesenin, is also one of the most gifted of the younger Russian poets. His first book was published in 1916. He is a member of a group which has come into being during the revolution, which calls itself Imaginisti, Imagists. 
Like Kluyev, he came from the masses, and like him operates with the intimate details of the peasant's life and faith. Whatever his political and literary associations, he is a poet. Dea Gracia. Upon Green Hills Upon green hills wild droves of horses blow the golden bloom off the days that go. From the high hillocks to the bluing bay falls the sheer pitch of heavy manes that sway. They toss their heads above the still lagoon, caught with a silver bridle by the moon, snorting in fear of their own shadow. They, to screen it with their manes, await the day. Hopes Painted by the Autumn Cold Hopes painted by the autumn cold are shining. My steady horse plods on like quiet fate. His moist dun lip is catching at the lining. When the coat flapping flutters and falls straight. On a far road the unseen traces leading neither to rest nor battle lure and fade. The golden heel of day will flash receding, And labors in the chest of years be laid. In the Clear Cold In the clear cold the dales grow blue and tremble, The iron hoofs beat sharply, knock on knock, The faded grasses in wide skirts assemble, Flung copper where the wind-blown branches rock. From empty straits, a slender arch ascending, Fog curls upon the air, and moss-wise grows, And evening, low above the wan streams bending, In their white waters washes his blue toes. Transfiguration 3 Eh, hey, Russians! Fowlers of the universe, you who trailed heaven with the net of dawn, lift your trumpets. Beneath the plough of storm, the dumb earth roars, golden tusked, the coulter breaks the cliffs. A new sower roams the fields, new seeds he casts into the furrows. A guest of light drives toward us in a coach, Across the clouds a mare races. The breech band on the mare, the blue, the bells on the breech band, the stars. Z. Shishova. This is one of the more gifted of the woman poets in the youngest choir. How strange, O oh God! How strange, O oh God, as in sleep's euthanasia, thy earth to-day, behind the window, each like an acacia, the poplars sway. From my small muff, my hand withdrawing slightly, I find it dry, and from my furs, as though may touch them lightly, faint perfumes fly. And through the night dark troubled dreams are rearing, They choke and cling, How shall I then forbear at last from fearing, O God, thy spring? Pyotr Oryeshin Oryeshin belongs to the poetic progeny of the Revolution. Not by hands created. 1. Fall on your face, drop. Mug forward into the swamps with your old weir wolves eye, cataract blinded. Look what a blade I am. Two. Carrot haired, big browed dawns and the darkness of forests, rye and the sheaves behind the village, my body. Three. Long ears tufted with red hair. Wag like asses' ears through the heavens. Four. Two convulsed eyes, two, oceans resting in me, and thick, bulbous lashes, 
burning green on my cheekbones. 5. My stone mouth is stretched with song from east to west. 6. Legs and hoofs kicked skyward, and the claw on my hairy paw blazes. 7. Gorged and motionless, like a bull, I have squatted rock fast in a long shirt of sunsets, and I sit now sprawled out on the fat hill of the universe. 8. Dark forests grow on my hairy belly, and in the stony fir trees, gray wolves in cope and quaff, having lit a taper, serve the mass. 9. Eternal, not by hands created, I roll my eyes heavily as roll the millstones of the blue mills of heaven. 10. Slowly I chew the cud of gray clouds, and think of perishing brothers with my wise cheerful belly. 11. Through closed lids I see, between my legs, new rivers heave new ground upon golden crests. 12. Listening to the earth I spit, with outthrust lower lip, and lo, rains pour with the sound of spears, and clinking pierce the earth. 13. Eternal, not by hands created, with the spirit of life-giving spring, I sweep the tilled field, and on the naked knees of the universe I pour the blue waters of my eternal triumph, Hosanna in the highest. End of section 14. Recording by Kevin Davidson. www.blogordie.com Section 15 of Modern Russian Poetry, an Anthology. Selected and translated by Babette Deutsch and Avram Yarmolinsky. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Davidson. Anatolia Maryengov. This young poet belongs to the Imaginist coterie. His verse is interesting for its sophisticated technique and its angular ruggedness. The title of the second poem given here refers to the month when the Soviets assumed power. Savage Nomad Hordes Savage nomad hordes of Asia poured fire out of the vats. Razin's execution is avenged, and Pugachev's pain, whose beard was torn away. Hooves have broken the scruff of the earth, cold with centuries, and the supernal sky, like a stocking with a hole in its heel, has been taken out of the laundry trough, wholly clean. October we trample filial obedience. We have gone and sat down saucily, keeping our hats on, our feet on the table. You don't like us, since we guffaw with blood, since we don't wash rags washed millions of times, since we suddenly dared, ear-splittingly, to bark, Wow! Yes, sir, the spine is as straight as a telephone pole. Not my spine only, but the spines of all Russians, for centuries, hunched. Who makes a louder noise on earth now than we? You say, Bedlam, no milestones, no stakes, straight to the devil. On the church porch our red can-can is glorious. What, you don't believe? Here are hordes, droves of clouds at men's beck and call, and the sky like a woman's cloak, and no eyelash of sun. Jesus is on the cross again, and Barabbas, we escort mealy mouth down the Tverskoy prospect. Who will interrupt us? The gallop of Scythian horses, violins bowing the Marseillaise? Has it ever been before heard of that the forger of steel bracelets for the globe should smoke his rotten tobacco as importantly as the officer used to clink his stirrups, 
you ask, and then? And then, dancing centuries, we shall knock at all doors, and no one will say, Gadamya, get out. We, we, we are everywhere, before the footlights in the center of the stage, not softy lyricists, but flaming buffoons. Pile rubbish, all the rubbish in a heap, like Savonarola to the sound of hymns, into the fire with it. Whom should we fear when the mundiculi of puny souls have become worlds? Every day of ours is a new chapter in the Bible. Every page will be great to thousands of generations. We are those about whom they will say the lucky ones lived in 1917, and you are still shouting, they perish. You are still whimpering lavishly, dunderheads. Isn't yesterday crushed like a dove by a motor emerging madly from the garage? End of section 15. Recording by Kevin Davidson. www.blogordie.com. End of Modern Russian Poetry. An anthology selected and translated by Babette Deutsch and Avram Yarmolinsky.